I had worked uh, overseas for six years in Southeast Asia, and I had been in the business for a long time, gone to a lot of trade shows, knew a lot of people that were in the industry. And um, I, I had a plan to, you know, I made a promise, personal promise to myself that before I turned 50 years old, that I would start my own business. Uh, I should have done that at a much younger age because you need a lot of energy to run a business. Thankfully, I, I do, I have a lot of energy, uh, but a lot of that energy comes from the excitement of doing what you, what you know is right and, and enjoying every moment of it. So how did I start the business? I put out a proposal to a few of my friends uh, that were in the industry, and in particular, um, uh, a gentleman, his name is uh, Mr. Her, uh, Her Jen. Uh, he read my proposal and thought, you know, why not? Let's let's make this happen. And um, they were they were a company in transition as well. They had made telescopes and eyepieces for a lot of the famous telescope companies out there and been in business for a while. Um, but uh, they didn't have their own brand. And in China, there, there was a paper that I'd read, a government paper, where they wanted companies to go from being an o OEM suppliers to having their own brands. And I thought, well, this, this makes sense. You know, let's, let's take the company that's actually making the product, let's build a brand, but let's, let's build in the quality and the, the features that the, the market's going to want. And so that was the approach. And um, uh, with that backing, um, Mr. Her uh, also later with um, uh, Rolf Bresser and with uh, uh, Helmut Ebert, they purchased Bresser, a company away from Meat Instruments. Meat Instruments was divesting itself of some of its assets, and one of them was the Bresser Company in Europe. They purchased that company. Once they told me of this news, they were very excited about it. I said, well, can we become the exclusive distributor uh, for Bresser products in the United States? And on a phone call, that's how that happened. Uh, the first light series of products and the Explorer 1 series of products that we have are internal house brands. These are brands that we came up with to address a product line. So first light is our mid-range tier of telescopes. It still has kind of the Explore brand. It's called Explore First Light. Uh, Explore One is a spinoff also from the Explore Scientific brand and is really kind of science toy level um, type products. Uh, we are also the official licensee for National Geographic. We do all their uh, binoculars and telescopes and microscopes. And we have the Discovery for a Discovery Channel brand uh, as well. And so that's, that's a, uh, all directed towards young astronomers. So in the amateur astronomy world, you have a couple of opportunities to engage a customer. One of them is from about age four years old, maybe up till about maybe 10 years old or 11 or 12. Once they get into their teenage years, uh, if you haven't got their attention by then, you've lost them, okay? They're, and they're engaged with their social activities, with school, uh, with gaming, with, uh, with uh, building relationships and stuff. Uh, after that happens, uh, then they're in their young 20s, they're uh, trying to get through school, build their careers, whatever. Uh, even into their 30s, maybe uh, they're working you know, very hard and have little time uh, to spend uh, on, on something like astronomy. But by the time they hit their 40s, you know, Galileo, I'll point out, started his astronomy career at age 45, okay. Um, uh, they now have the discretionary income and they have the inclination and the interest to do something like astronomy. So you do need to spend the time uh, uh, to really get into the serious end of this hobby. It's great when we see younger people getting into it, uh, but uh, um, I think that planting the seeds really starts with someone very young, you know, four to eight, maybe up to 10 years old, um, you know, and really planting those seeds to get them interested in science, you know, and this is the real important part. This is why I'm into you know, I'm not selling washing machines or laser copiers or something, you know, maybe a lot more profitable than selling a telescope, okay, because it's, it's not a hugely profitable business. Um, but uh, uh, the, 
the excitement of seeing someone learn something about themselves, their place in the universe. They have become uh, more aware of, of how the, the inner workings of the universe is, okay, and, and what that means to them. We think builds better citizenry. You know, we think that, um, we think that uh, it, it actually makes a better world. Astronomers and non-astronomers across the country, maybe from around the world, are getting ready for the August 21st, 2017 total eclipse of the sun. Um, I noticed that uh, Astronomy Magazine in their April edition here uh, did a nice review of the uh, ED-80 Essential Series uh, telescope. This is an airspace triplet. I thought of the name Explore Scientific because I wanted the company's name to be what we do. You know, uh, and so I do a lot of web development uh, in the past. I did, for instance, uh, Meet Instruments for about 21 years. And uh, when the web was new, you know, I, I, I was self-taught uh, to do HTML, and I, I brought out Mead's first websites. Uh, and uh, having looked at those websites now, <laughs> you know, I realized they weren't that, uh, that great. But it was, uh, I guess, state-of-the-art at the time. But I, I worked it backwards. Uh, I started uh, searching for uh, names, you know, that would go along with what we're doing, you know. So, and it just so happened I, I was able to type in explore scientific, and then I did a, uh, I thought that sounds pretty good, and um, uh, I did a domain search, and there it was. It was wide open, so I took it, uh, explorescientific.com and uh, that became the brand name of the company. When someone is getting something that you made, you know, and, and you've kind of put your heart and soul into uh, designing something and making something, and, and someone gets it, and they're able, to, uh, they're able to use it in a way that, you know, I, I try to make product that can essentially disappear. I want people, to use a telescope and for the for the telescope itself to disappear so that they're exploring with it and they're they're seeing stuff they've never seen before or they're seeing it better than they've ever seen it before um, uh, you know whether it's visual or if they're doing astrophotography when I when I see them go to like what they feel is the next level for them I, I feel like uh, I it's a wonderful feeling I mean to know that you've made something like that um, I don't take credit, though, for uh, what our company is, and I don't take credit for the product per se, because the product's nothing without the users. Uh, the product's nothing, the brand is nothing without uh, the customer. You know, the brand lives with them. You know, we're the janitors. Those of us that work at Explore Scientific, we're janitors for the brand, you know. The brand lives with that customer, and so if we're doing our job, then they're getting the product that they need, they have the support that they need, and we're supporting their lifestyle. We're supporting their lifestyle of exploration. 20 seconds and counting. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. 6. kid you know I grew up during the Apollo era and uh, we were all uh, you know absolutely uh, you know glued to the television watching you know the Apollo 11 space capsule go up and we knew that we were actually really going to the moon you know it was just uh, it, just to describe that to you today I mean kids People today, uh, after that generation, you know, we were constantly in space. We were constantly doing these amazing things. But to go to the moon for the very first time, to step foot on another uh, body, you know, a celestial body like that was, it was the thing of science fiction. And so uh, we were all, our generation, many of us were interested in space in general. 
Most of us wanted telescopes, and I begged my parents uh, like crazy, I pestered them to get me a telescope, to get me a telescope. And I finally did get my first telescope, and seeing the moon through my own telescope was so gratifying to me. Uh, I lost track of that telescope. It was a little 40 millimeter push-pull zoom refractor from Kmart. And, you know, I talked to my dad about it. I asked him, you know, how do they arrive at getting this telescope? And uh, he said, well, I, you know, you'd pestered us for a, a couple of years for a telescope. And he was working at a place called LTV, uh, which was an aerospace company. And so there were people there that were amateur astronomers and stuff, and they were mentioning to him that he should get a refractor, and they were giving him advice. Uh, after, after the kind of this long drawn out thing of two years, he decided I was ready for a telescope. And um, uh, seeing, seeing the moon and the craters of the moon through that telescope, I, I, it's still burned in my memory now, you know. Uh, I was nine turning 10 years old at that time. I lost track of the telescope because, you know, I disassembled it, I I'd messed it up, you know, took the eyepieces apart, or the eyepiece apart, there was only one eyepiece to it. And so I, for years and years and years, I'd always wondered about, you know, what had happened to the telescope eventually. I'm sure my parents threw it away because it was, it, you know, it's just a, torn up. And uh, um, about uh, two years ago, I got the bug to try to find that telescope. And this is an interesting story because the one day that I really seriously go to find this telescope, I search on eBay and uh, I find the telescope. And it was in brand new condition from 1970. And I think, oh my God, you know, this is the telescope. And I figured that you know, there was like a $30 bid on it or something like that already. And, so I put up a high bid of 100 bucks. I wanted this telescope so badly. I get it for $34. It's shipped to me. It is absolutely brand new mint condition. So I took this telescope out and I did the same thing again. I pulled the eyepiece out and looked at the moon and that same, very same rush, and I don't even know how this happens, but that very same rush of seeing the moon for the very first time hit me like a ton of bricks. And I, I go, okay, this is, this is why I'm into astronomy and uh, getting the backstory from my dad about it really uh, was interesting to me, so. You'll talk to amateur astronomers, they'll tell you, hey, I started when I was a boy or a girl and I've always been doing it and I still do it and I'm gonna do it the rest of my life. That is them, that's their lifestyle, that's who they are. You have to remember, astronomy is a lifestyle. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not a sport, it's not a, uh, it's, it is, uh, as, as, astronomers identify them, that's who they are, okay? That's, that's what it's all about. And the gear and all the marketing and all the rest of that stuff, that's really just, that's just something that's part of their world. Um, but uh, uh, for people that, had an experience or had some uh, experiences when they were young and now they're in their 40s or 50s or maybe they're just now newly retired and they're trying to think of what, you know, what am I going to do uh, with this time and this money that I have? What should I be up to? Um, I would say that uh, uh, you have to get out and you have to engage the public. and so. Uh, I'm very involved in public education and astronomy. I run a, uh, we have a nonprofit organization called Astronomy Outreach Network, and uh, uh, we support, Astronomy Outreach Network supports other people that do public education and astronomy. And what's public education and astronomy? This ranges all the way from people that get on a street corner with their telescope and show people the moon to uh, people that are doing a little bit more formal education, like in schools, you know, they're augmenting what their teachers don't know with their knowledge and, you know, they're helping out the school in that way, to professional uh, public education uh, people. Uh, so, the, you know, that's the EPO community that's associated with the observatories and planetariums and uh, NASA has a massive EPO program. So. Uh, there you're exposing a lot of people of all ages and one of the most enjoyable things that I do, the juice for me, 
is to get out on a street corner you know, in a busy city and show people Saturn for the first time. And you will get people of every age, of every walk of life, you know, and I have yet to meet people that really are turned off by that. Um, uh, I think almost everyone is curious about the night sky, they're curious about how far away things are. It is a, it's a question of our origins, you know, and where we're going. So hey guys, here we are at Table Mountain. This is day three. Uh, we had some clouds last night, so everybody kind of chilled out and didn't do much uh, of stargazing. But it, it, it cleared at 2 a.m. Oh, was that? I yep. didn't hear that. So two, we were from two to four. Bed. Apparently, it was unbelievably yeah. good. So. And today the weather's absolutely stunning. And uh, a lot of people have asked me, you know, how how long I've been in business, how long have I been working, you know, and the deal was is that. Uh, uh, my parents are relatively poor. Uh, my mother was a single mom uh, from about from my age, about six years old. And uh, uh, in second grade, I had a bad teacher experience, and I didn't want to go back to school. And uh, I was telling my parents that, and I said, "Look, I don't want to go back to school. I hate school. I'm in second grade, right?" And um, so my parents, they said, "Well, you know, if you don't want to go to school, you got to go get a job." And so I said, fine, I'll go get a job, you know. And so they gave me one day to go try to find a job. So they actually let me out of school. I go down to downtown, uh, uh, you know, where I was. And of course, no one's going to give a second grader a job, you know, of course. But by the time I'm eight years old in the third grade, I do get a job. And I'm working as a janitor inside of a church. You know, so that worked out. I think it, that was also supported by my parents. I had a great third grade teacher. I, school was great at that point. My job gave me a sense of uh, self-worth and, um, uh, and I had a little bit of change in my pocket. So it was great. Uh, but by the time I hit 12 years old and I'd been working pretty much continuously from eight until 12, uh, I thought, well, you know, I don't want to be a janitor all my life and so I loved art, uh, but I thought photography would be a good uh, vocation, and I got my first camera when I was 12. By the time I'm 14, I have a full-blown darkroom, and uh, uh, in those teenage years, not too long afterwards, I, I start working professionally, and uh, you know, I'm doing weddings, I'm doing all kinds of photography, um, and I don't, I'm not involved in astronomy, per se, at that time. Uh, but I'm always fascinated by telescopes and optics of any kind. Uh, I just love optics. And so um, uh, I start working at Oceanside Photographic Center, which was an old camera store. And um, I uh, uh, eventually uh, we establish that we're going to that we sell telescopes there. And I sold them as telephoto lenses for photography at first. But I would take the scopes out front and we would aim them at the moon and people just came from everywhere to see these larger telescopes and to look at the moon and so I started learning more about the celestial objects out there and it's at this time that I meet people from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, I meet people from Palomar Observatory, you know uh, the community, the scientific community comes out in a way that and embraces this, uh, our experience in using telescopes and sharing that experience with the public, it's something I'd never experienced before. Um, the scientific community and astronomers in general uh, are very sharing people. They want everyone to understand what's going out in space. They want them to, they want to improve their scientific literacy, you know, to know where our place is in the universe. Hi everybody, uh, Scott Roberts here. I'm back with uh, Barbara Jean, the Vintage Airstream. I've been showing you some pictures. I'm back from my trip in China. And uh, we have um, uh, now all the, uh, all the plumbing has been installed. Uh, most of the electrical has been installed. Uh, behind me here, you can start to see the uh, shower. I've always wanted, uh, I've always wanted like some sort of uh, a bus or some sort of trailer or something like that. I had this bug since I was about 18 years old. And uh, I was at a point in my life where I could actually make that happen. And so um, I did a lot of reading. I, I was originally going to convert a bus and 
um, and then I started watching uh, uh, recreational vehicle crash videos on YouTube, okay? It's not pretty. There is no safety oversight uh, for recreational vehicles per se. And um, so uh, it kind of led me to looking at um, uh, trailers as well. And trailer crash videos are also horrible. Uh, but uh, one thing I found was is that the Airstream trailers, that something like over 70% of them are still on the road. And they've been, they're the oldest trailer manufacturer around. And so uh, also they're beautiful. I think that the Art Mardern look of an Airstream is very cool. So I found one that uh, was actually here in California. It was a 1968 model. The body looked good and everything. And so I bought it, I towed it back and started the process of restoration. Since that time, uh, we took the Airstream coast to coast. Uh, we traveled over 20,000 miles with the Airstream. And we did everything from the Winter Star Party all the way up to uh, Table Mountain Star Party up in uh, you know, the northwest corner. So uh, it was, uh, it's been really amazing uh, experience. And to have people, there's a, this, this thing about people are just kind of attracted to the Airstream itself, you know. And uh, so wherever we, we go, people want to look at it. They want to look inside of it and get inside of it if they can. So we're happy to oblige that. People that know us and have seen us at star parties know that sometimes we're out until late at night. Uh, uh, we will share, you know, if, if the atmosphere is right, we'll have cocktails out. We will, uh, we party. I mean, this is, <laughs> so we don't want to hide, you know, we don't want to hide. Now, I know that that's, that some people want to get away from a crowd or whatever and, uh, Especially people in the industry, if, they're, if you're bombarded all day and you've got people asking you the same question again and again and again, uh, and if you get tired of that, you would want to hide. I, I can get that. Um, but I, I never get tired. You know, people, people have asked me the same questions millions of times, and I'm always interested to find out, you know, if they ask me a question that I've heard a thousand times, I start asking them questions, you know, and I, I try to get under their skin a little bit to find out really what's exciting to them and why they're into it because I'm passionate about it, you know. I can't imagine anything more amazing than, you know, seeing fossil light and seeing back in time and to, to see supernova as we've seen and you know if you were uh, around when the comet impacts hit Jupiter and watching that happen you know and uh, you know we got this eclipse coming up on August 21st 2017 you know how many people are going to be blown away you know millions of people are going to see this on the center line and I think uh, I think it was Lou Mayo at NASA told me that NASA thinks this is going to be the biggest science event in human history. I, you know, I can't wait to be part of that. I can't wait to ask, answer all the questions that people might have out there. So I want to be in the thick of it. I don't want to hide.
Uh, I was born in Japan and started astronomy almost four years ago. That time, of course, no computer. Just to, I wanted to use a film camera. And uh, I like camera before, but I wanted to attach camera to something else. And the first optics was uh, um, microscope. So taking something with a microscope. Then next step is I use telescope with camera. And meanwhile also uh, I take picture and uh, developing film myself and the printing myself. That almost four years ago. That's uh, my uh, first step for, to into astronomy uh, as a hobby. My basic motto is I'm selling as a company, uh, I'm carrying and selling product what I tested, I used myself and accepted. Uh, that uh, we ca I'm carrying those products. Uh, otherwise, uh, I cannot uh, suggest or recommend customer. And so basically, uh, the product uh, I'm carrying as a Hutech, I knew I know everything from merit or demerit, advantage or disadvantage, I know everything. So that's why I can uh, answer all of questions from customer. So, uh, I don't say only good thing about that. Each product has a various point, a good point or not good point. So uh, I honestly, I can tell customer. So if particular customer is not looking for right part, I say so. So this is not your product. And also, I'm, I don't carry that. So please uh, check around as a place. So I'm, so always, I direct talk with customer honestly, and what is this customer, what this customer looking for. So if it's not the right part, I, I tell, uh, clearly tell, tell to this customer. Optical design is all done in Japan, uh, however, I deeply involved from uh, developing stage and uh, ma mainly uh, mechanical part. So how it looks like and how mechanical part working good. And uh, it, it's my always question is this finish is good, uh, good, uh, good looking for American or European customer or not. That's my uh, biggest point to start for developing. From beginning, always my optical designer uh, thinking about uh, a finished product for imaging purpose. So that's why a designer didn't think about only objective lens. At the same time, uh, always uh, thinking about uh, a best match with a field partner or a reducer. So that uh, addition, other extra four element lens. So it's not extra uh, part, just from beginning, a uh, designer is designed same time to, for perfect match. So this is a wide, a dedicated system. So this is a, a additional four element, is dedicated design for 107 Flowrider. Both used to have various uh, telescope, including ED element. Uh, however, uh, ED telescope is getting more popular in the market. So now we are more focusing on fluoride uh, optics. It's very unique, only coming from Japan. And uh, polished it, made uh, by Canon Optron. So that's a, a kind of key sales point for both. And 107 is this moment is uh, top of the line and the small brother is 90 flow right, and there is the same optical configuration, and one flow right, one ED, and total six element advanced spectral design. Those are uh, kind of uh, high end, and uh, this one is one smallest uh, 55 flow right. So, and also we have uh, 71 flow right, and uh, 90 flow right. Uh, in my personal opinion, Fluorite is uh, clearly different from any ED in my experience. And I feel fluorite shows us very transparent and high color contrast. So that's, uh, for me, is obvious difference. Yeah, so it's no comparison. 
with e even any kind of ED, high-end ED. I'm, in my opinion, it's different. Personally, I like wide field and the nebulosity. And it depends on uh, target. Uh, basically, I like a uh, uh, big, uh, big sensor. So almost automatically, its uh, target should be larger. But uh, sometimes, I like uh, small galaxies. That time, I use a uh, uh, dedicated CCD camera because uh, that maybe create more high uh, resolution image. I think at least I, I can tell, because this is a hobby. Hobby means it's culture. So because of culture and uh, always different, American people, Japanese people, and European people has each slightly unique culture. And uh, Japanese people generally like smaller, compact, uh, product. But meanwhile, American people probably opposite side. So, simply saying, uh, always I'm telling to Japanese friend, uh, the culture-wise, or mind culture is Japanese uh, mind, American mind is all opposite side. Meanwhile, European people is middle, and other Asian people is close to Japanese. So maybe. That's my using my marketing strategies because some the telescope Japanese people is not always is favorite for America. So I have to always think about uh, uh, the particular product it's favorite for particular market or not. That's my marketing strategies. If customer make ha is happy for our product, that's my Goal. Uh, because I'm one of a hobby person, I know people's expecting the product, and if it is satisfied, I'm happy too. So meet myself same thing. So that's why I'm always thinking about uh, uh, thinking about each person, uh, the a product buying from us is. It makes a happy to customer or not. That's my always concern. And if some feedback is uh, uh, very good feedback, I'm very uh, glad it's, it's feedback too.
Hi everybody, my name is Dan O'Malley from telescopes.net and we're here today with Jeff Dickerman from Optech Inc. And Jeff, you're going to tell us about a couple of your products or yeah. uh, a few of your products that you have here. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. yeah, so I'm Jeff uh, from Optech. Um, we're, uh, we're located in Michigan and uh, it's really nice to be out here in California. Um, we've kind of made our uh, uh, history on uh, telescope uh, focusers. Uh, so we kind of do the things between the telescope and the camera, focusers, mm -hmm. uh, camera rotators, things like that. Right. Um, so uh, our, our intro product was the TCF-S, the mm -hmm. first serial-based uh, uh, focuser that goes on the back of an SCT. And that's kind of, uh, mer um, kind of migrated into the uh, TCF Lynx. That's our newest control system. Mm -hmm. So basically the TCF uh, Lynx will fit on the back of the scope. Uh, we'll just remove the uh, existing adapter. This is a Mead, for instance, and then put our adapter on there, and then the focuser fits on on the back. It's a, it's a uh, about 100 millimeters at full extension. Mm -hmm. We get about 15 millimeters of travel, and what it does is it gives you real precise focusing and repeatable focusing every night. It'll be at the same spot. We have a homing procedure that guarantees repeatability, and uh, the first prototypes when we made these back in uh, early 2000s. Uh, we'd put on the scope and leave them there for months, and we wouldn't have to refocus. So, so it's really good for remote applications? Absolutely, well. absolutely. Okay. Yeah, all our products are designed so that you can work with them in your backyard mm -hmm. or halfway around the world. Um, we have a lot of uh, inter or Ethernet uh, uh, capability in our newer products, and uh, uh, we still carry forward with the serial as well because those are easy mm -hmm. for hobbyists to kind of play with and, uh, and work with. Fantastic. What are some of the other ones? I noticed you do have some of the smaller focusers, which I was very curious about. Yes. Uh, some years ago, we partnered with uh, Feather Touch, uh -huh. uh, Starlight Instruments. Um, mm -hmm. Good guys down there, Wayne and John. Mm -hmm. And uh, we developed the QuickSync motors. They, they market them as their HSM, their handy stepper motor. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the key to these things is that they have a clutch mechanism right. that allows you to engage the motor and disengage the motor, and then also focus with your fine focus there. Got it. Now, when you say uh, with the fine focus, are you saying you can also move it manually with it? Absolutely. Yeah, you, okay. can, you can move it manually. So if, you, if you're at the scope, you have an mm -hmm. eyepiece, you can easily put it in and just um, roll the motor back, mm -hmm. find your uh, best focus, gotcha. and then tighten it back up. And then you rely on the... And then for, yeah, for imaging or anything of that sort, mm -hmm. you would uh, then just connect up through your PC or through our hand control. We have a real nice hand control that uh, attaches to the hub box. Gotcha. And that's got this uh, fine focus uh, encoder on it. So this is if you would want to run it independently without a computer? Exactly. Yeah. Okay, got it. Yep, yep. How, how, is, how is it compatible as far as different focusers? How does that come about? Compatibility? Well, we, uh, we have all the Feather Touch line um, covered. Right. Uh, we have, uh, we have <coughs> um, our newest one is the Skywatcher uh, nice. line of, uh, of focusers, the ones that they put on all of their scopes. Right. Um, we have all the Stellar View uh, uh, focusers taken care of. Um, we've developed a big one here for the Mead. Right. Um, this uh, actually fits on the ACF, the F8 ACFs, oh, nice. where they have the reverse Crayford. Yes. Not this scope, but they have the reverse Crayford. Mm -hmm. And this is the same kind of clutch mechanism. You just roll the motor out of the way, you have Very your nice. fine focus knob, right. roll it back in, and you're good to go. So these things, in a way, are all custom fitted for a specific scope, in a way, right? Exactly, yeah. They, uh, um, Rather than develop a one-size-fits-all, mm -hmm. mechanically there are a lot of problems with that. You end up, pin, up pulling the pinion uh, uh, mechanics out. Right. You can uh, bend the shaft or you can, you can have uh, greater friction because of the shaft. Mm -hmm. We do a custom job on all the focusers so that uh, we're, we've got a good centration, a good geared connection to that pinion shaft Very and specific. drive it in and out. And we try to keep everything at least one micron or better in, uh, in resolution. Wow. So, okay. Yeah. That's fantastic. Okay, that's very specific. I like that. Um, I notice you have another couple here. Yes, I have a different type of focuser. This is our, uh, this is our um, TCF Leo. Okay. This is our newest product. Uh, it's only an inch and a quarter. Yes. So it's about the size of a, uh, an eyepiece barrel. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it has about n uh, nine millimeters of travel. Gotcha. The resolution on it is crazy. It's 0 .08 microns. That's like 80 nanometers. Wow. Um, but uh, uh, it will it will work in the same way with the same Focus Links hub, which is mm -hmm. a dual hub. Right. So you can actually have a second stepper board you stuff in there, and then you can control two focusers from the one hub, and that saves you some money in the end. 
Right. Uh, again, it's, it's kind of got this strange shape because it fits between the knobs on the uh, Celestron Edge HD C11, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, I notice here, it looks like it's kind of set up for visual configuration. Is that sometimes the case uh, with people that use, you know, imagers or Occasionally, observers um, that use it? Or yeah, I notice there is a compression ring adapter in there. And there is a compression ring, yeah. we uh, Most of our stuff is done for the imager. Right. But oftentimes, somebody buys a new scope, they want to do some visual work, mm -hmm. so we give them the ability to do that. Right, so if they wanted to thread it on, they just switch out adapters. It's just, yeah, it's just an adapter. It's not a big deal. So the uh, um, the brass insert ring yeah. uh, was a customer request. Um, yeah. We prefer a good, solid three-point contact, three-point fully constrained, and that's right. what we prefer. But we did, uh, we did look at the... Um, the brass compression rings that are available, and they all have uh, problems of slipping and things like that. Right. So we create a special jig, and we take our brass strips, and we uh, um, run them through this jig, right. and it gives us a shape, and it also puts an emboss all the way around, so that we've actually got little micro mm -hmm. teeth that bite into the. I notice it because when I look at it, it has kind of a yeah, a exactly. linear striation to it. It's yeah. pretty cool. Kind of like a neural, but it's not really a neural. Yeah. It's it's like I say, kind of micro teeth, right. and that gets gets to the point where you'll never lose an uh, optic mm -hmm. out of it. Gives a little more bite. Oh, it does indeed. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, and then we have another one. Yes. Here. We, we also have some rotators. Yes. So our rotators, uh, this is our Pixis LE. We've had this out for se several years. It's a, yeah. it's a good little uh, rotator for um, rotating your camera. Right. And the reason you want to do that, there's usually three reasons. Yeah. One is image composition. That's what we probably sell the most of these for. Somebody mm -hmm. wants to, to orient the camera so that they can get the whole galaxy or you know the, the um, full nebula. Right. So that's probably the easiest way to do it hands, on, uh, hands off. Right. You just tell the uh, computer, yes. um, go to this position angle. Or actually the way it's set up in the Sky X and, um, and some of the other planetarium programs is mm -hmm. you can actually put an overlay that shows the pickoff camera yes. or your, you know, That's your, right. your guide camera. You drag it around, drop it at a star, and the camera rotator so takes the camera. So oriented in the correct position. Yeah, exactly. So if Fantastic. you have an off-axis guider or you know, one of the S-Big cameras that's kind of built in, Right. Um, you can't go wrong with a camera rotator. Is there a particular load capacity this is set at, or is that this one? Uh, we rate for about ten pounds. Gotcha. Yep, and uh, <coughs> um, we do have our Pixis two inch, which has just been redesigned. Right. It's got a new uh, um, Ethernet interface too. Okay. It doesn't have the big nose piece in front, but it comes with one. Got These it. are all removable, which is real nice because then we can actually create an adapter right. with one of our standard dovetails that goes on the back of the scope, just like mm -hmm. the focuser. So it's T-threaded, to, it goes directly into the camera. Yeah, these are all two-inch nose piece yeah. to T-thread on the back. Gotcha. So the camera size T-thread, mm -hmm. the, you know, the telescope side is a, is a standard two-inch, or we can do something more interesting with the, with the Pixis two-inch uh, rotators. Very nice. They're beautiful. And yeah. I might add, the finish on these are really superb. What's the name of that finish again? <laughs> the, uh, it's, so, a, it's a special anodized finish that yeah. we do. We call it a frost coat. Right. <clears throat> um, and uh, it kind of hides fingerprints and yeah. uh, lasts forever. Um, yeah, just it's nice, really hard, durable. Quality. Yeah. Yeah. And we do all the machining in-house. So and it's a, made in USA. And it's made in USA. <laughs> yeah. We, uh, we have a full CNC shop. Right. So we do all our own uh, design and manufacturing. Mm -hmm. um, we do the boards. This has a, a little electronic circuit board in there that we build those in-house. We have mm -hmm. a, a reflow oven and a pick-and-place uh, machine. Um, we, uh, we do all our own optics. We have an optics lab. So we try to cover all the bases in-house. Mm -hmm. uh, we get better control that way, and, and quality is the, the most important thing for us. We want these things to work forever. Yeah, I just I was looking earlier at like some of the mass-produced stuff that comes from overseas compared to what this looks like. I mean, it's like night and day difference of quality. You can see the craftsmanship that's been put into it, a lot of heart and soul. Thank you. And I love that. It's just yeah. great. I like that it's made here. Yeah, and we're trying, like I say, we try to be the leaders in what we do. So things like you know, adding Ethernet ports to all of our devices mm -hmm. is, uh, um, is the next big step, of course, for cameras and for mount systems. So it makes sense that the things that fit between the camera mm -hmm. and the telescope also have Ethernet. It's very nice. Yeah. Good. Um, we also have the uh, flats, right? Yes. Cover that. These are cool. This is interesting. <laughs> so this is a uh, flip flat device, and it's basically a motorized electroluminescence panel. Mm -hmm. And what you do with that is you can then get your your sky. You can have flats done whenever you want. You don't have to catch a good time of night at, you know. Some people <laughs> would be curious what the purpose of taking flats would be. Ah. You know. Well, the reason Basically. you want flats yeah. um, is you have to calibrate your entire image array. 
Yeah. Right? So each, each pixel has different sensitivity. So part of the process, we do, we do our darks, which are kind of built in now. Mm -hmm. your, bias and, or your bias is built in, and the darks are you know, another step we do. And then the mm -hmm. third step is flat field correction. Right. So um, think of it as white balance. Mm -hmm. It's really just like a white balance in the old camera days. Mm -hmm. You need to have a good white background, um, and it's kind of hard to get in the sky. Right. You get, it, with uh, sky flats, you might get gradients and things of that sort. Right, of course. So this is like on the fly. You can do it whenever you want. Right? That's the key. Yeah, this is this is a convenience item. People yeah. love these things, and they typically are uh, designed to go up on um, some of the Apos and uh, other yeah. refractors out there. Um, you can do your flats whenever you want. It looks like a little Hubble scope, guys. It, it does. It kind of opens it, it up. Can't even move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have a friend that has one, and I saw it. It was like the Hubble telescope. You yeah, know? just opens up. It's very nice. Yeah. yeah. And then one of the things that we've done um, is again another. Uh -huh. Again, another customer request. We, we get a lot of our product ideas from the customers. Right. And they're on the field. They, they give us a lot of information. They say, well, why can't we just put a Batonov mask mm -hmm. on one of these? Right. So we developed a product that does exactly that. Oh, fantastic. And there's a Batonov mask. For folks. It detaches. And then this can double as a uh, dust cover as well. You right. put a dust cover piece on it. So you yeah. can close and open remotely. Of course. That's you know, brilliant. Or use a Batonov mask if you want to have it as a focus aid. Jeff, thanks for being here. It was really great. Oh, I thanks. appreciate all the feedback. It's wonderful just so always. wonderful to, to have you come out here and talk to you in person. Yeah, it's great to see you guys. You uh, you do such a good job for us. We really appreciate uh, yeah. you being the eyes on for us. With the Thank customers. you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for watching, everybody. All right, good morning, everybody. Hopefully you guys can hear us and our audio is working absolutely fine. Uh, my name is Simon, I am the Super Astronomer, in case you don't realize that because I do the super things so you don't have to. And today we actually have quite a jam packed session for you guys. Um, we have Mike from Starlight, Insta uh, Starlight Express. God, always get that too confused. <laughs> Starlight Express. Um, we also have Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific and, of course, Adam Block, who is going to be the uh, main event, for lack of a better description, 
although everybody has equal uh, time in the spotlight as far as I'm concerned. So, uh, Mike, before we launch into uh, the new product side of things, let's talk a little bit about guiding um, and how we actually utilize things because there's a lot of misinformation out there as far as we're concerned in terms of choosing the right camera. Now, for certain some people, uh, budget is a big cons uh, concern, but then for the other guys out there who are looking for performance, um, what what is it that they should really be looking for? So uh, one of the primary things is um, obviously a very sensitive camera, um, something that downloads fairly quickly. Um, but the other thing is uh, field of view is obviously important. Um, but uh, being able to manipulate the sensor, like binning, um, you know, and, and that sort of thing is is very important. Um, it very much depends on the sort of imaging you're doing. So if you're doing very short focal length refractors, um, your guiding errors are much, much lower. Um, so you can get away with um, a, a less sensitive um, guide camera. However, um, anything more than, um, I would say, 600 millimeters or, 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 or more, um, the guiding sometimes in certain areas of the sky it can become quite difficult to to find a guide star um, especially if you're doing off-axis guiding rather than using a separate guide scope um, which is generally the way people are tending to go now um, the separate guide scope um, was around for for many years because um, firstly uh, cameras weren't particularly sensitive going back into the sort of early 90s um, into the 2000s um, and uh, also um, sort of uh, the, the, the long focal length telescopes were generally Schmitz um, and uh, they had a very small uh, flat field um, which meant that if you had a pick off prism you were generally outside of that flat field as well um, but obviously nowadays with uh, correctors and, um, and things like the edge uh, then you get a much bigger field of view. So um, you're mentioning, uh, for those people at home who are new to this, you're mentioning about off-axis guiders and guide scopes. Um, you guys opted primarily to work with uh, off-axis guiding, um, as you just mentioned, but what are the two major differences between the two? While well, my cat decides to sit on me. <laughs> So the, the, the main difference is um, if you're using an off-axis, um, sorry, a, a separate guide scope, um, they work very well. And the advantage is that you end up with a very large field of view to find your, your guide star. Uh, so finding a guide star is relatively easy. The biggest issue um, is differential flexure. So um, what you can find is that, especially as you're moving from one object to another, um, that the guide scope will actually move relatively relative to the main scope, which means that although your guiding may seem quite accurate um, on the graphs, um, you end up with um, sort of elongated stars where the optics have shifted a bit, especially with um, uh, things like SCTs and, and, and that sort of thing where you get sort of mirror movement uh, in the optical system. The advantage of uh, of um, off-axis guiding is your imaging and guiding through the same optical tube um, and the advantage of that is then um, obviously you've got a better match for your guide scope uh, so your um, focal length um, for your guide camera and your main camera um, so uh, that's generally a better way of doing it and you obviously get around this uh, this mirror flop issue. Uh, I mean I, I usually tell people who are new into this hobby if you're going to get into guiding, start with a guide scope of some description. Um, there are plenty of options out there, just purely because it's good to get your feet wet into the whole foray of things. But when it comes down to getting some of the higher end uh, images or pushing for that full optimal performance, you've got to go down the off-axis guider. I mean, I, I started with um, a, gui a guide scope or a mini guide scope and things like that. And, you know, came across that problem with flexure. That was my biggest mm. problem. It was just driving me nuts. And then once I got into off-axis guiding, it was like, geez, 
what was I doing from the get go? But the, the, the biggest problem that I came across was my guide camera then suddenly became the weakest link because in all honesty, I spent, you know, just like everybody else does, I spent $150 um, or uh, I think maybe about 179 pounds in the UK for one of the more inexpensive guide cameras. And it was great until I started doing off axis guiding. So the biggest problem that I came across was noise. It was horrendous at certain times. And then when I'm pointing at a galaxy that is like, you know, that big, and you can't really have, there's, there's, there's no stars anywhere uh, to really guide off of other than the core of the galaxy. You just can't do that. So go into a, a bit more information about the differences behind say the Lodestar and the Ultrastar cameras on what makes that big difference and, you know, why we spend that extra money uh, because some people can't justify it but the results speak for itself. Yeah, we find that um, uh, a lot of our customers tended to start, like you say, uh, with the lower end uh, sort of CMOS type images. Um, and they end up virtually throwing them away because um, they they find that they do struggle finding guide stars. Um, and it, it's, it's, I mean, the Lodestar is um, effectively an expensive um, guide camera. However, you only buy it once. Um, it will work um, with off-axis guiding. It will work with um, uh, a separate guide scope if you wanted to. Um, but the, the main thing is that you'll, you, know, you, you purchase it once and then you can use it um, whatever optical system you're looking to use. Um, the primary reason um, for that is that um, you have, because it's a CCD, um, it has very high QE. We're looking at uh, QEs of around 77%, which is pretty good. Um, and very low noise. We've now released the, uh, the, uh, the low style and the ultra style pro, um, which were only released last week. Um, and these have lower read noise than the existing one. We've, we've knocked about three electron read noise off the, uh, of the original load star X2. Um, and having that extra sensitivity, that lower read noise means that we can guide either on fainter stars um, or uh, we can take slightly longer exposures and still see some of those faint stars because the low, uh, the, the read noise and also the, the thermal noise on these sensors is incredibly low. Um, but the main advantage is um, you have the ability to bin the pixels. Um, so if, uh, if you want to speed up your download, um, or you have a very, very long focal length. And uh, you know, I mean, we, we've got customers that are using these on six meter focal length. Um, so <laughs> the, uh, the field of view is very, very small, um, but the Lodestar um, still copes admirably. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's, it's just one of those guide cameras that you, you buy and, and you won't need to buy another, buy another one, basically. One. Yeah. But I mean, so you touched on um, binning. There's a big difference between hardware binning and software binning um, because people just think binning is binning for some weird reason. Um, go into that because I think people still don't understand what that is actually doing. Okay, so um, the advantage of hardware binning is that um, you are binning on chip. So you're effectively taking four pixels and dumping the charge of all four of those pixels into the storage register, register and then reading that out. Um, if you bin it off chip, um, you're, you're not having the same effectively increase in the full well depth. Um, so the, with the Lodestar, I mean, it's got native um, 8.6 by 8.3 micron pixels. So if you bin that two by two, you're almost up to sort of 17 micron pixels. Um, so these are huge um, sort of photon buckets, uh, gathering buckets. Um, so uh, finding guide stars is, is really a very simple process. And the good thing about this is, let's just say uh, we do a, an average typical setup and we're doing say two second exposures. We're also, with the two, uh, two by two binning, we're also mitigating a lot of seeing as well. So we're not chasing the seeing, which is another thing that people do. Uh, 
and, and I see this all the time in PhD, people are like tinkering with numbers and messing with stuff. And I say to them, look, you, you just click on this brain icon, um, plug in your focal length, the pixel size. Do you want to do two by two, four by four, one by one, binning, whatever it is that you want to set to and leave everything alone. Um, you know, I think you've made a demonstration about this before with overcorrection on the mount. So like the teeth chattering and things like that. Do you want to um, elaborate a bit more on that? Yeah, so um, most mounts, um, unless they're a direct drive um, system, they tend to have motors that are effectively driving the worm gears. Um, and as you're pulsing um, those gears, you're speeding them up or slowing them down, depending on what corrections you're making. Um, but with any uh, motor, uh, you have a hysteresis. So the, uh, the, the field builds up around uh, in, inside the motor to make the motor move faster or slower. But there's obviously a time delay. So if you're um, doing correction to try and chase the seeing, um, what you're doing, you're pulsing the motors so quick, they don't know whether they're um, starting up or slowing down or, or, or what they're doing. So if you're the best way to, to generally do guiding is to um, is to base is to uh, slow the thing down a little bit um, so that you're not chasing the guiding. So you're driving the motors in one direction, then the other, but you're not sort of uh, confusing them too much. Right, and that tends to happen with uh, a lot of people where they say they get this um, uh, vibration effect, uh, an oscillation, for lack of a better mm. description, and that's because the gears are chattering like this. They're trying to go backwards and forwards. And then th this is another thing that I've come across where people say, well, I use PEC that is supposed to fix that. And every time I have PEC running with um, a PhD, I get all these problems. Like, well, that is a part of this problem is your corrections are becoming over corrections, uh, which you know becomes that big problem. Um, so let's let's have a look at the cameras because this is the part that makes me excited is you've actually got two new cameras, even though they're yes. still called the low star and the uh, ultra star, but there's something different. Okay, so. Uh... Okay, can we start the video? Yeah, ask the start. Oh, uh... Here we go. Okay, there we go. Okay, so um, we've got here, the, the new Lodestar, I'll try and get it in the right yep, part of the camera. Um, so we have a, a half inch format sensor. Uh, so it's a relatively large sensor for a guide camera. Um, and as I say, uh, the pixel size are sort of nine, uh, nearly nine microns, 8.6 by 8.3 microns. Um, and as I said, most people, I, I personally tend to use it in bin two by two um, because you're only looking for centroid of the star um, so you're not looking for really pretty pictures or anything like that. So um, it means the download times are very quick. Uh, and we're looking at around about 60 to 80 millisecond download times um, in VIN 2x2. Um, so we have a C-mount thread on the front here. Uh, so that will just screw onto an off-axis guider or various accessories, uh, depending on how your optical setup is. Um, on the back, uh, we have, there we go, uh, we have a USB 2. Uh, connection and we also have the RJ12 connection here. Uh, we also have a, a, a bicolor LED here which uh, is the power LED but as your corrections are being pulsed you'll see that uh, the LED is flashing as well to make uh, to indicate that the corrections are actually working as well um, and obviously we've got the new engraved logo etc on there. Um, and, and it's blue. It's blue so we we for the last 30 years, all our cameras have been black virtually. Um, but uh, we have been asked by a few of our dealers, uh, when are you going to make a, a, a color camera? Uh, oh, sorry, a different colored body. So we've chosen this blue, which uh, goes with our with our logo, roughly. Anyway, um, so uh, all the new Lowstar Pros are this lovely blue color, sort of a yeah. petrol uh, blue. Are, they, are, are these replacing the Lowstar X2s? They are. So we do actually have new electronics inside um, and obviously a new barrel as well. Uh, so the new electronics allows us to, we're down to 
around about five, five and a half electrons uh, read noise on the on the load star. Um, but we're down to about three and a half electrons on the ultra star. So the um, and the other thing is this is uh, one and a quarter inch. Uh, right. So this if you're if you are using it in a, a, an eyepiece, um, this will just literally drop in uh, into your eyepiece. So how does that compare against the Ultrastar Pro now? So the Ultrastar Pro is here. So if you, I don't know if you can, if I get it correctly, um, you can see there that the um, Ultrastar Pro is about twice the area, yep. um, the active area of the Lodestar. Um, the pixel size is about six and a half micron, 6.45 micron so slightly smaller pixels um, but again you can bin those two by two so you're up to 13 micron um, the download time is around about uh, 550 milliseconds so it's a little bit quicker than the uh, original ultra star um, again we're up at around 77 75 to 77 qe um, and it's got the, the same uh, features on the back and uh, obviously the c-mount front and the uh, engraving um, but as I say the read noise on this now is down to about three and a half electrons so we've not uh, around about three electron read noise um, from the old version to the new one um, with the the ultra star especially uh, we also have um, some software called starlight live now the starlight live software allows you to do some auto stacking so it's effectively live stacking um, what we find is that the ultra star is is used quite a bit for uh, outreach programs uh, because again you don't need any power supply it's, it's powered and driven through the usb um, so all you need is your computer this drops into the eyepiece of your telescope and then you can effectively do live stacking straight away uh, with the starlight live software and obviously with the new version with the uh, the lower read noise, um, then that makes a huge difference. Um, we also, the, the, the thermal noise, although these aren't actually called CCD cameras like uh, our main range of cameras, uh, the thermal noise on the Sony sensors is incredibly low, um, much lower than a lot of the CMOS sensors. Um, so uh, you can basically take sort of 10, 15 minutes, maybe, uh, sorry, it's 15, 20 second exposures um, and then stack those together and uh, you can get some incredibly good images. And it's it gives you that sort of instant wow factor using the uh, the live view software. Um, so out of interest, I get asked this all the time, is the window on the front of the camera, um, does it have UV coatings? Is it clear glass? Um, does it have anti-reflective? So on our guide cameras, uh, we don't actually have a, a, a window. Um, we opted not for having the window um, because glass generally uh, loses, even if it's got AR coating, you're still losing 3% light, um, potentially even more, um, depending on the wavelength. So there is a, a window actually on the sensor itself, uh, which is AR coated. Um, but uh, we'd opted to go straight through to the sensor. Um, because we're not cooling these, there isn't that um, condensation forming on the sensor. Uh, so, um, yeah, we're effectively you, you gain an extra 3% or so uh, light going through. Right. So now how does that integrate in with your filter wheel? Because um, you know, we, we've spoken about the MIDI filter wheel before, and yeah. it's one of these things that drives everybody crazy when you're buying a system and there's bits and pieces that you throw in and you're going to get your back focus figured out it's like you guys have it almost sussed out for everybody we're turning off by say a millimeter tops yeah so our midi wheel uh, which is this one here um this is a, a new seven position one and a quarter inch filter wheel um it's powered and driven through the usb so again you don't have extra power supplies um and the top here has a C-mount thread. Uh, so the ultra star or low star just literally screws on the top here. Um, and then we use this uh, one here to move the camera up and down the, uh, the prism tube to get yourself, to get par focal with the main camera. So the main camera sits on the back here um, and this is your telescope side. 
Um, and then once that's in place, you lock that off. We also have a little uh, hex um, uh, screw as well that you can just lock it off. Uh, and then you don't touch it again. Um, and then you can use this one and this one will move the, uh, the, the prism assembly in and out of the field of view of the, uh, of the main camera or the, of the optical side. Um, so, I mean, personally, my setup is exactly like this uh, with one of our cameras and I never ever touch the ultra, uh, well, I've actually got a load star on there. I never bother trying to move it um, or struggle finding a guide star or anything. So uh, um, mine's just literally sat there um, and fixed. So you pretty much only ever do that once. Now, you've also got something um, on the side there. That's an AO, I believe. Yeah. So this is um, this is our active optics. Now, we said earlier about the, the fact that motors have this hysteresis that start and stop, um, and which is why you end up sort of chasing the guide star. This is a optical system, uh, optical component that goes um, generally in front. So normally you would have that uh, in front of your filter wheel, something like that, okay? And then you would have the main camera screwed on the back. Actually, I can screw one of our six nine fours in the back here. So you would end up, that's your, uh, your camera setup. And then the AO would literally sit in front here. And what we do with the active optics unit is the optical window um, is movable. And we actually use a refractive index of the glass to shift the image around on the main CCD. So as the light's coming through the AO, we choose a guide star as you would normally. Um, and then if there's any movement in that guide star between guide frames, instead of sending mount corrections, we actually move the optics. So we, we move the light beam coming through um, and we can do that very, very quickly. We, the, the corrections are only five milliseconds. Um, so you can actually make that correction very quickly. So typically most people are tending to use the AO system at around sort of 10, 15 frames per second. Um, but the, the main difference is that we use step motors to control the position of the optics. So we can make those corrections very, very quickly, but also very accurately. And it then means that you can then get sort of pinpoint stars uh, rather than the sort of the bloated stars where your um, where your mount is sort of chasing your guide frames. Um, on the side here, we also have a mount correction as well. Uh, so that will actually go back to your guide port on your mount so that if you have drift, if your uh, telescope isn't set up perfectly. If you have drift in one direction, um, the, the AO will actually bump your mount back the other way. And in doing so, it also makes the optical corrections going back the other way as well. So this becomes um, a, a very, very good optical system, especially if you're using longer focal lengths. Now, typically, um, most people using a meter focal length or upwards um, would see a difference using the AO unit. Um, we actually have um, an FSQ 106. I think it runs at F 5.5, I think, something like that. Um, so you're only looking at sort of 550 millimeter focal length. Um, and we can actually tell when the AO is on and when it's not, even at that sort of focal length. Um, so they do work incredibly well. Um, a lot of people that do end up buying these um, are amazed how well they work. It's just that it's another investment on your optical system, um, but it does turn your less than really expensive mount into uh, an expensive mount effectively because you're not relying on the uh, on the mount um, gearing as such. Uh, you're you're tending to uh, make those corrections beforehand. Now, if I was actually imaging through the uh, AO, um, I mean, this almost needs to be like a whole discussion on its own right in so many ways, but 
what can I expect to see? Forget the guiding for a second. Let's just say I've got the 694 one and a Spree 100 or something like that, which is uh, what 550 millimeter focal length f5.5. How does how does having something like the adaptive optics on there make a difference if I was doing say nebulas? So the the main difference is that you'd get better contrast. Um, so the spot size of your um, scope, obviously, the, the, uh, you, you would end up being able to get the most out of your mount, out of your optics. Um, so if you have a, a, a a mount that isn't particularly good at guiding, um, even with something like your um, your Skywatcher uh, optical system, um, you would end up with much better pinpoint starts. Um, so, I mean, as I say, generally speaking, most people are tending to use these on things like the 150 um, the, right. uh, and above. So you're looking at sort of 12, 1300 millimeter focal length. Um, and if you've got an SCT or a CDK or anything like that, these are, you know, an absolute godsend, especially as I said earlier, and we've got one customer using on um, using the AO um, actually on a um, six meter focal length. So you can imagine um, that is, is quite a challenge for it. Okay, I, I, we've got to, we have to address this one because I know what someone's going to say to me is, will it work on a RASA? Uh, Probably, I mean, on the 14 inch, um, it would probably be okay um, because you've got a relatively longish focal length. Um, I personally wouldn't. The biggest problem you've got is that this takes up about um, 14 millimeters of back focus. Um, so the advantage of this setup here is that the total back focus of this is 55 millimeters which is spot on for your um, things like your Skywatcher system where you've got um, a focal reducer um, fitted as well. They, most focal reducers tend to have a back focus of around um, the, the 55 millimeters set up. So if you then add your AO system into that, um, it means then you have to use it without the, the producer in there as well. Um, so you have to be very careful that your optical system has enough back focus to actually put the AO in there. Um, but uh, it, it, if you can fit it in, it makes a huge difference, which is why on things like um, at the SCTs um, and the CDKs and, and those sort of things, they tend to have um, sort of 200 millimeter of back focus, um, depending on what part of the um, optical train you take it from. Right. So I'm just looking at the live chat and um, Wade, uh, Wade, but I know who Wade is and um, he's, he's having, he's making me laugh actually in so many ways. He's can I asking, move back to the other one? yeah, you can go back to the other one. I think okay. you can do that. Okay. So the interesting thing that he's mentioning, uh, let me make sure I mute the right camera, stop video. All right, I've done it. Okay. Uh, the interesting thing that he's uh, mentioning here is why are we still using USB 2 as opposed to the newer USB 3 style sockets, um, either whether it be USB C, uh, which look like the lightning port for a lack of better description, why are we still using the USB micro uh, connector? Um, for us, it's a little bit historic, um, and uh, the USB cables generally are um, more readily available. You can get much longer cables. Um, we supply a three meter cable with the uh, the low star and the ultra star. Um, we also, I forgot to mention that earlier, but on the back of the main cameras, um, all of our cameras have USB hubs built in. So we have um, small cable, short cables that go from uh, the back of the camera to the load star and then to the um, filter wheel as well. So you can't see it because I'm black as well. Yeah, um, no, they, so, they probably know. Yeah. So I mean, um, one, of, one of the things that I like to tell people about the difference with the USB 2, USB 3, the USB 3 power usage for PCBs, the chip itself is completely different to USB 2. So that's one issue that um, a lot of camera and accessory manufacturers are beginning to address. Um, one of the other problems that I constantly run into is the, is the type of cable. If you're running USB 3.0, okay, and I'm mentioning 3.0 specifically, 
you're actually limited to length. In fact, mm. the longer it gets, the more likely it is not to work. And I come across people who use these great big USB 2 extension cables to get back to their you know, computer or however it is that they operate their setups. And when they do upgrade to USB 3.0, the number one complaint or the number one problem I always keep having to field is it doesn't work, it doesn't see that thing. And I say, look, take a laptop out there, plug it in, does it connect? Yes, it does. Okay, plug it into your repeater, now plug it in, it doesn't work. I said, that's because you've exceeded the actual <clears throat> specified length of 3.0, which is why 3.1 rushed out. And now they're up to 3.2. So the problem, the biggest problem for me, at least, and I owned, yes, some manufacturers are adopting it, but the changing standard is forcing pricing to shoot up again, which is becoming another problem. And that's why they've just opted for 3.0 and for other cameras, just USB 2. And to be honest, we don't need that type of throughput anyway. So why am I going to pay extra for something that I can't actually utilize? Well, that's the thing. I mean, we talked earlier about, um, you know, taking um, one second um, guide frames um, rather than, you know, hundreds of seconds, a hundred frames per second or something. Um, you know, you're not going to get any benefit for doing that. So we're already getting um, in bin two by two, you're already getting 60 millisecond downloads um so effectively sort of 15 frames per second or more um so you don't really need any higher throughput than that so usb2 is is it's a bit more proven um and yeah. tried and tested and you can use longer cables um and as i say the cables generally um we found that they tend to have a lower impedance um on longer cables than uh, some of the usb3 stuff um, so, uh, we've, so we've stuck with USB 2 for the time being anyway. So for those of you at home, what we're, he's referring to about the impedance is if you notice that there are some USB 2 cables with blocks on them, um, I, when I'm connecting my camera, I go out of my way to use my cables that have the blocks um, in order to stop this interference. USB 3 generally doesn't have them, and they have very skinny, thin-looking cables that are somewhat debatable for lack of better description. Um, and again, I, I've experienced countless problems um, when it comes down to USB 3, uh, especially with some of the, the other camera manufacturers out there. And I have to have a direct interface into my laptop or I have to go out and get a powered hub um, in order to get any of these you know, high puts, uh, high speed frame rates. So there's pros and cons to the whole thing at the end of the day. Yes, I understand why some people are saying, you know. Why don't we update to USB 3? Well, they're going to be USB 3 style connectors, but it's still USB 2 technology at the end of the day. So hopefully, Wade, um, I, I know you, you're good for a game and it's good for a joke and all this kind of stuff, but you know, hopefully that uh, answers that part of that question. Um, so I'm going to move on now. Um, how does your system integrate together um, when it comes down to everything? Because a lot of these companies that produce this stuff, it's just all bolt on um, bits and pieces. Nothing is really truly the way it's supposed to be. But you guys, when you design the system from the ground up, everything follows one particular thing. Yeah. So um, well, you're, on a, you're talking about the main yes. sort of camera systems. Yeah. Yes. So. Um, as I say, our primary goal when we put the uh, filter wheels together with the off-axis guider and the main cameras was to try and get that 55 millimeters. Um, so everything's been designed around that, that key figure. Um, but uh, we've always been um, very much a modular type um, camera manufacturer. So our filter wheels don't necessarily have to use our cameras. Um, you can use anybody's cameras. Obviously, ours are the better ones. Um, but, uh, uh, and the same with the guide cameras, uh, you know, the you can use other guide cameras. Um, you may find that as you progress with your um, hobby um, with astronomy, you end up wanting, you know, you may start with a very short focal length system, um, but you may end up sort of wanting a little bit more focal length, a bit, um, and, and gradually you find that, um, your CMOS guide camera can't really um, perform to the best that uh, you you require. So that's so if you buy the Lodestar to start with right at the beginning, 
um, that will see you through pretty much all your focal lengths um, that you um, use over the over the period. Um, so, but but the main key thing for us is that um, we've made everything modular. We've also tried to keep everything so it's powered through the USB. Um, so the filter wheel, the um, guide cameras are all powered and driven through the USB. So you don't have, or you can reduce the number of power cables coming up through to the to the system. You only have effectively 12 volts going into the camera and mm -hmm. then everything coming off that. So um, we've, we've, we've mentioned the, the Ultra and the Lodestar being the Pro. Of course, the 694 has had that treatment are there other plans on some of the other cameras receiving the same treatment at some point? So all the um, Sony sensors, uh, apart from the M25, um, are, have been now upgraded to the Pro series. So your um, A25, the 694, the 674, the 814, and the 834, they're all Pro systems now. Um, so uh, going forward, they're all going to be blue and they're all going to be pro. Um, the pro series effectively, again, like the Lodestar and the Oddstar, we've reduced the read noise um, and uh, we've increased the, uh, um, or sorry, decreased the download times as well. Um, spectroscopy, what, how, how does the pro version now, uh, the, uh, the ultra style of the Lodestar, how does that now affect the spectroscopy side of things? I almost forgot to ask you that. Um, so we we are just about to release a, a new spectrograph as well. I think we Correct. had we, it in. Um, we've already done that anyway. Yep. Um, so the with the um, the Pro series, something like the six nine four, having a lower read noise gives you a much bigger dynamic range. Um, so for things like spectroscopy, um, that will give you effectively uh, a better sensitivity um, for the the star that you're looking at. Um, and the spectrum should be clearer um, and more defined. And when is that spectroscope going to be out? It's out or it's out now? Um, we we have um, started shipping a couple um, right. to a few uh, key um, companies um, and and key key customers. Um, we haven't actually put it through full production yet, uh, primarily because we're we're so busy at the moment. Um, but uh, um, we, sh it's something that is, uh, is very high on our list of, of things to do. So hopefully by the, uh, the mid or the end of next month, um, we should have it, uh, going through production fully. Um, oh, there's actually a good question here now. Um, I was looking at Trius Pro 825. Does anybody know if this is a good fit with the William Optics Xena Star 80? Um, I think that was a double off the top of my head, that scope. So it's an 80 millimeter objective, basically, uh, as a doublet, I think. Um, it will work perfectly well. Um, the pixel size is six and a half micro microns, um, 6.45 microns. So it would be a, a very good sensitive um, camera for that, sen that setup. Um, potentially, you might want to look at some slightly smaller pixels. Um, if, you, if you have the budget, um, then, we have the 674, which is the same physical size sensor. So it's a, a um, two third inch format, but that has um, four and a half micron pixels. Um, that might be a better pixel match for the for the 80 mil. Um, ideally, if you if um, if you can, then the, the 694 is, is probably a better option all round. Um, but uh, that is a little bit more expensive still. Um, so the A25 would work very well, um, but the 674 may be a slightly better match on the pixel size. You know, personally, I always, um, I personally would always go with the 694 if you're in, into the pretty picture aspect side of things, because um, I've used that camera on almost every aperture with exception of the big, big, larger aperture scope, purely because I don't really have one. <laughs> I think the biggest scope I own is a 150. Um, well, I lied. I've got a 12 inch Newtonian, so I know it works on that pretty damn good. But if you're if you're asking or looking for a robust camera where it's one size fits multiple scopes, I think the 694 um, for you at least uh, would be better in, in so many ways. Yes, I know it's going to be more money. I'm not trying to make you spend more money, but I'm looking for longevity 
uh, behind all of this. The idea here is, is the amount of other cameras I've gone through and um, you probably saw Scott Roberts just flash on briefly just there because he's going to be doing the next talk. Um, during one of his live streams, I ended up giving away my 1600 to him because that poor camera has sat on the shelf um, ever since I got the 694. That, that's all that camera has ever done is sat on the shelf because I just thought, why on earth am I going to use this thing any longer? Because it's such a difference. And I'm kind of glad that you know, more customers have, have um, become more accustomed to that idea of going in that direction because some people say it's a step back. Um, I don't want to get into the CCD versus CMOS um, argument again because we've had this numerous times now, but it honestly makes that big of a difference, especially, well, at least for me, it does. Um, yeah, the, the, the big advantage of the 694 is that um, it will work very well on on short focal length systems and as i said earlier most people tend to start with a short focal length um optical system a, a refract or something similar um but as you progress you want to do um you know more galaxy work or something like that so you actually want a longer focal length and where the 694 comes in is that um it's very good up to sort of a, a one 1.2 meter focal length but if you want to go further than that uh, with a two meter or two and a half meter, you can bin the pixels, as we said earlier, um, being a CCD, we can do actual on chip binning, um, which means that your four and a half micron pixels suddenly become nine micron pixels, um, which then become a perfect match for your two meter, two and a half meter right. focal length scope. Um, and that makes a big difference when you're, you're not oversampling, you're, you know, you're, you're sampling as, as, as good as you can get. We have a customer that bought a 10-inch um, RC uh, a while back, and he was dead set on getting the 825. Um, and, I, and I couldn't understand why initially until uh, I was actually up on his roof setting the whole thing up. And then when we, when we got burst light, basically, uh, and he showed me this galaxy, and I know that galaxy, when, I, when I've shot it before, it's tiny but his covered the entire field of view. And I was like, holy crap, this is like mm. crazy stuff all of a sudden. And he go, he actually said to me, he goes, one of these days, I'm going to be sitting here staring at that galaxy and a supernova is going to go off and I'm going to be there to capture it. And I was like, well, you got the right camera for it. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So yeah, take a look at that um, 694. I, like I said, it is well worth it. For, well, I mean, if this is your first dedicated camera, it will be the first and possibly the last camera that you want. Like I said, I own a dozen uh, cameras at the moment from the 1600 to the 2600, uh, but the 694 as my mono camera is my main imaging camera. I, I don't even bother with picking up anything else any longer, just purely because I, I'm so accustomed to it. I'm so used to the way it works. Yeah, um, I mean, I've I've got um, I've got access to virtually any any sensor mm -hmm. uh, any ccd from the 825 all the way up to a 16803 and um i confess my 694 sits on my scope virtually all year round yeah mm -hmm. it's actually one of the best cameras out there mm -hmm. cool um any other sneak previews that we can probably glean out of you because this is i love this is why i love you guys is because you always innovate stuff and there's always something like going all right, Mike, what, what have you got for me today? Yeah, I, unfortunately, I haven't got anything that uh, um, is close enough to uh, to be able to show. Um, but we do have, uh, we've currently got four, five design projects going at the moment. Um, so uh, we are still innovating even through this uh, this current climate. Cool. I think I'm going to have to drag you back uh, to do a demonstration of the adaptive optics system because we've never uh, touched on that. In fact, I think from a video standpoint, we've kind of avoided it for a long, long time, just purely because it can seem very scary. And there, we probably have to spend a lot of time dispelling a lot of misbeliefs on it. Because when people think adaptive optics, nine times out of 10, they're thinking of the big telescope with the yellow lasers, and this mm -hmm. mirror that warps around, which, that's you right. know, that is adaptive optics. That's a form of it. But there are other ways to do adaptive optics. And uh, Starlight Express has one method of doing it. It's very similar to other people's. 
and then there are completely different systems out there. So I think for the for the people at home, we kind of want to spend probably an old day just dealing with this particular thing. It's yeah, we're, we're, thing. We're, we're very careful when we talk about um, uh, these systems. We always class them as active optics rather than adaptive. We're not trying to adapt for the seeing conditions. What we're doing is creating an active optical system to make those corrections for you. Um, we actually, um, I think our very first active optics system um, was around about 2000, 2001. Um, and we actually had a, we, we have a patent on it, uh, which um, other manufacturers actually infringe, uh, mm. but we've never, <laughs> never done anything about it. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's been around a long time. Um, and as I say, there's a lot of um, prominent people using them. Um, and if you do ever get around to using one, it may, it, it, it I've had, uh, when we first released it, we had a, a prominent imager here in the UK. Um, he had been imaging for about 14 years and, uh, he decided to take the plunge and, um, buy the AO unit. And he phoned me up about a week later and said, it's the first time in 14 years he's had pinpoint stars. So, uh, you know, that's, that's really, um, that's sort of an accolade. Without going into it, because again, we need to spend a, a whole session with this. How easy is it to use? Because I think that's the scary part with um, adaptive optics is, oh my God, nobody knows how to do this or nobody knows the, the, the setups and the software. I think that's the critical part is the software, I guess. Okay, so that's actually the easy part. Um, so nowadays, uh, PhD has, um, gosh, PhD two, has um, our active optics incorporated within it. Um, so you just need to set up uh, the fact that you're using an AO unit and um, PhD will actually go away and calibrate everything for you. Um, it really is as, almost as simple as setting up an auto guider. Ooh, I think we're gonna have to drag you back to see this in action. <laughs> Definitely have to do that. Um, yes. Well, we're gonna have to try and find the night where it was actually clear over here. <laughs> Well, we could actually do possibly do a fun test. Um, I've seen this happen before or seen people do a, a test like this before, but you could do something similar to the Schleringer test um, if we can get an artificial star or something like that and mm -hmm. put a heater <laughs> underneath it and you can see it ripple, the heat rippling up. So that might be a, a potential way because that way we can control it. Because if we have like, let's just say for the one day that we do this and you have five <laughs> out of five C, and you're like, well, great. This really doesn't, you know, prove anything. So I could just imagine that happening. But yes, I'm definitely going to drag you back and show these guys um, what uh, adaptive uh, optics and active optics are, the differences between them and how they work and how can they integrate it in their systems and and don't be scared by the price of these things um yes i know some of them are like some ungodly amount of money but guess what the more popular this becomes the more likely price and cost can be driven down because you've got to understand units like this it's not like mike makes ten thousand of these things and leaves them in a warehouse <laughs> for you to buy them i mean he'd love you to do that and so would i of course uh but you know we have limited uh, quantities at any one given moment, which is a good thing because it means that somebody's actually paying attention to what they're doing. That's why you don't see the market flooded with these things. Thank God. So yeah, I, I'm definitely looking forward to dragging you back. Um, so I believe Scott is hanging around in the wings. Hopefully he can hear me um, and he'll suddenly just pop back up out of existence or pop back in. Maybe I should just ding him. Uh, ask to start video. Ask to unmute. And then I can just probably call him as well. So, um, Mike, you're more than welcome to hang around with us uh, while Scott does his thing. Uh, we're going to go for a quick break. So, if you guys just want to go to the bathroom, uh, grab yourself a coffee or whatever it is that you want to do, uh, we will be back again in about 10 minutes. So, it's now 12.50 here in California. Uh, we will be back in 10 minutes, okay? So don't go nowhere other than to the bathroom.
Okay, sorry about that. Um, hopefully you guys can hear us. Um, I guess the audio would, did not transition across again as usual. Oh. So okay. anybody knows how to fix this? Okay, when I transition, I expect the mute, the audio to you know transition bam, back. The right there. Yeah, That's and right. it doesn't. It never works. Anyway, all it's I was saying is, is this is this is this is Scott Roberts. Nobody heard us about the the uh, the toilet jokes. So yeah, we didn't want. Yeah, we wanted to spare you that. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. For those of you at home who do not know who Scott Roberts is, um, he is basically the the dad of astronomy for all of us. Uh, and the joke we had a minute ago was, you know, everybody is like, this is this is Scott Roberts, the dad of everything, and you need a shoulder to cry on. There he is. Yes. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. So here, here's the actual. Well, you could use this shoulder, I guess. I don't know. Well, is, is the other one getting tired now? Well, you know, so many on that side. <laughs> oh, I see. So friends and family on this side, strangers on the other. Strangers on that side. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy. OK, <clears throat> um, so before we go launching into um, any of these products, I think one of the things that uh, you do the most is outreach programs, star parties and that is almost like if we go to any major event, we're always guaranteed to find you. Even if you aren't slated, you just appear out of thin air sometimes. I remember doing uh, AIC last year and, you know, you weren't supposed to be there or you weren't planning to be there. And I, then... I wasn't planning to. I got invited, you know, um, the, actually it was Laz Mandy who invited me, you know. Right. So that was cool. I'd never been before. What a fabulous event. And uh, I remember, uh, Simon, the program that you put on. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I was able to get away, and I'd heard that you were going to have a special uh, video presentation, and I saw that. Simon, I have to say that that was so professionally done, and so on just the, the feeling that got across from it and everything, you know, all these people talking about what astronomy means to them, and, uh, uh, you know, and with the tone of uh, astrophotography outreach, and it was just incredible. I mean, you should be you know, making more of those. I think. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, the I, funny thing is, though, when I produced that video, um, I didn't, it's not that it didn't have the impact I'm expecting, but what I wasn't expecting was for all the vendors to say, nobody has actually gotten all the vendors together from a video standpoint oh, where rare. they're not jostling against each other. They, at the end of the day, when it comes down to this hobby, yes, we're all vendors, we're all retailers like myself, for example. I mean, at the end of yeah. the day, I'm still trying to hawk people, you know, products. But for this one brief moment, uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, I will post uh, a link on how to watch the video because it's actually posted everywhere now. Um, we see all the heavy hitters in the industry um, talking about what makes the exception of me I, I wasn't in it so yeah you well you weren't there i wasn't a heavy three hitter. years ago three years ago you weren't around i was hoping that you were going to be there because i know you, you have these oh, great yeah, stories yeah. it was shot at maybe it was shot at aic correct it was shot aic three years ago so not the one that the one that you were at um and i've only been to one right okay. Oh, right. And it's the one before that was when this was initially filmed. And I was actually was relatively new. new to all of this. That was the funny thing. So right. I didn't know what to expect. I, um, a lot of these guys I've never met before, which was a good thing because then <clears throat> they know that not to be so uh, sales orientated. Mm -hmm. And to hear everybody talk about the astronomy community and the reason why we all love this hobby as a collective meant something. And I've got this great photograph of where everybody, you know, um, stood together on the floor uh, with each other because we are all friends. You know, we, we talk about this company and that company and this, that and the other, but we're all friends at the end of the day. You know, it's, it's not like some evil empire that Scott Roberts owns. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, anyway. Now my name comes out. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Like I said, you are the dad of astronomy, no matter what. <laughs> right. that no matter well, I what. I do remember many of the people in the industry when they were quite young, you know. Uh, and um, so it's, you know, when you've been around it for, it's now going on 40 years. 1980 is really when it kind of started, you know, uh, for the serious side. And 
selling telescopes and stuff and learning more about it. And uh, I was selling cameras at a place mm -hmm. called Oceanside Photographic Center, mm -hmm. right? which is a camera shop that's been around since just right after World War II. And um, <clears throat> so that eventually became Oceanside Photo and Telescope. Yep. Uh, after running that for just a few years, I went on to meet instruments and here we are. So, um, but- Funny you uh, should say that is, if you remember three years ago, me and you shot a video. Um, we did an interview a while back. Yes. I just played that um, before we started. So I think everybody knows the story already because this, okay, for those of you who don't know this, Scott, if you ever are at a star party and you've got, and, and it's clouded over and you go, what the hell are we going to do while we wait? And if Scott's running around, sit down and listen to one of his stories, because one of the best stories he's ever told, uh, at least for me, is his first telescope that he went out of his way to find again. And it's popped up in your live streams quite a few times, which is really fun. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah The yeah. Tasco uh, telescope. Right. Well, it's actually a Kmart telescope. Oh, it's Kmart. It's a Kmart. And I didn't, oh. I didn't bring it into the showroom with me. It sits on my desk. Um, and um, <clears throat> so it is an interesting story. And I have variously said that this is the original telescope. It is the original model of the telescope. I didn't mm -hmm. tell the full, full backstory of this. The full backstory is um, that uh, I, uh, you know, was thinking about my original first telescope and what that meant to me. Okay, um, and uh, so a lot of my friends ha still have their very actual first telescope, you know, and they they won't let go let go of it, even though it's on a what we would say a crappy tripod and maybe has terrible optics and and everything about it is bad you know and in comparison to what you can buy today um or maybe what you use today you know so uh but the inspiration that somebody can get from that and how long that inspiration can last is really important right and so this telescope was uh uh, the culmination of me uh, really begging my parents for a couple of years, just every, at every opportunity, hey, I want a telescope, I want a telescope. Finally, they cave. And uh, this is after the Apollo uh, landing on the moon, you know, mm -hmm. so here we are, uh, Christmas 1970. And uh, I'm 10 years old at the time. And uh, you just gave away how old you are. <laughs> yeah. I'm old. <laughs> I'm old enough to be his dad. Okay. Yeah, so, literally. <laughs> so, so um, I get this telescope, and I'm just I'm blown away. Uh, it's it is only a 40 millimeter telescope. It has a tube, no optics, a tube for the finder scope. Okay, that has no adjustments, by the way, on a metal tripod that flops around on on the tabletop. Okay, uh, the the eyepiece magnification is changed by drawing a tube in and out, and it does have oh, a round. Oh, that's right. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. But but no no right angle diagonal. I mean, you have to like crane your head around, and and at, at uh, you know ten years old, uh, we're still flexible enough to do that. <laughs> but um, the story goes is that I started thinking about it. And I was going, gosh, I really wish I had that telescope. Now, my, my parents uh, knew I liked to take things apart and I liked to repair things. I repaired my sister's toys, for example. I repaired my toys. I would fix broken things around the house. I just liked seeing how things worked, you know? And uh, so they let me take my telescope apart uh, many times, you know, and uh, um, taking the lenses apart, taking the eyepiece lenses apart, trying to reassemble them, trying to make it work again, you know? And I did, but over the period of time of taking it apart, tearing it down, using it like crazy outside to either look at the moon or spy on my friends, um, you know, eventually this telescope was uh, one of the toys, quote unquote toys, that my mother probably threw away at one point, you know, after so many years. And, um, uh, so I, I was thinking about it, I was going, gosh, you know, I wish I could find that telescope, I wish I could. 
And I, the first time, Simon, I, I, I told you the story, the first time I look at eBay yep. to search for it, the very first time I find it. And I'm thinking, wow, this must have been a popular telescope. You know, I found it like that on eBay. All right. Not only, not only was it on eBay, but it was, it was uh, from 1970. Okay. Still in the original box, still with the original tag, still wrapped in a newspaper that said 1970 on it. Okay. All right. Still has the date on it. Uh, and it was on bid for like, I think it was $20 bid for it. So I bid it up for 150. I want this telescope. Okay. And eventually I won the bid and it only cost me like $35 and it was shipped to me. And I looked, I, I pulled it out immediately and looked at the moon. And sometimes you get these deja vu moments, okay? I had this deja vu rush of the first time that I ever saw the moon through a telescope. Happened to me all over again when I looked at that little 40 millimeter. So since that time, I've tried to find another one, maybe to give to one of my kids. Nope, can't find it, can't find it. So it was just that one time so far, and it's just a... Uh, I, I, I somehow feel like I was meant to find it or something, you know? Right. So, right? So that's that's it. But I keep it on my desk. I often refer to it in my videos as a point of inspiration for me. Um, and uh, it reminds me that even the most humble of equipment can inspire somebody to go to very far distances, you know? Mm -hmm. um, Right now, Simon, I'm uh, in the shows and I'm doing the Global Star Parties. Right. I, I found a, uh, there was a girl, a uh, high school girl in Nepal uh, who uh, was really interested in science and stuff. And so I, I, I send her a little chat and she chats back and she tells me how interested she is in space exploration and everything to do about astronomy. So I invite her on the show. Since that time, her friends in Nepal have been sending me friend requests and stuff. So we're going to have more young people on there. But these guys don't even have a telescope. They have books. They have the internet. No, no telescope at all. No toy telescope. No nothing. Okay. And so I, I think a little project that I'm going to be working on is to see how we can get a telescope all the way into Nepal where they won't be charged, uh, you know, crazy uh, import duty or something like that to get it. Um, so it's, uh, she is associated with a couple of clubs. I, I'm going to be checking into it. Getting a scope is not the problem. Getting no, it it's there. getting it there is the getting problem. Getting it there. And getting yeah. it there into the country is not a problem. It's actually getting it into their hands is the problem, you know, so. What, why do I get the feeling that you're going to be on a plane going to Nepal soon? <laughs> Well, unfortunately, with COVID, I'm not on a plane going to anywhere soon. So. Well, yeah, that's so true. You and I have been doing these, um, you know, online um, uh, experiences, and and it's but nice it, because people from anywhere in the world can listen to us and and ask questions, and you know, so so that's that's very cool. Well, I mean, so th this is the thing. I mean, the the whole nature of how we do astronomy has completely changed for all of us. And um, I, I guess this will be a great transition into um, why you're actually here is. Yeah, why am I here? Well, you actually have a product that um, you invited me onto one of your live streams. And I wasn't aware of what I was seeing until I was looking at it and then um, seeing it physically on the screen i'm like going wait, wait hold on a minute where did this thing come from right so you know there's a, guy, a couple of guys on the uh, live stream chat who are just waiting to see this thing because they already already know what it is yeah, so you know I, it is. I, I don't think we would need to talk anymore to drag time out or anything like that but let's get into it you okay. basically come up with um a a pop-up observatory for a lack of better description and it's not That's just what it is. any yeah. old pop-up observatory it's one that is actually really simple to set up and i almost want you to tell me how did you come up with the theory and the idea behind it because i'm so shocked no one else has done it well and me too i i'm like you know I, i've seen observatory tents most of them pretty expensive you know um uh 
But, um, uh, and I've been inside of a couple of them, uh, you know, and I've seen the guys construct them with tent poles and all the rest of it. And, yeah, it's too and then, much. They, then they crawl down into them and then they're kind of like laying down or having on, they're sitting on something very low profile because, you know, they're not very tall. And so uh, our company, uh, we make all kinds of stuff. Of course, we have telescopes, but we do outdoor stuff. Uh, for kids, we have like um, what we call discovery kits where people, you know, kids can go out and collect uh, butterflies or, you know, the, whatever. And then there, there, there's like a little jar with a magnifying glass so they can see them safely and stuff and then let them, you know, catch and release. But we also came up with uh, uh, play structures. And I was looking at these play structures and I was going, wow, what kind of shapes and designs could these play structures be? Um, uh, there is, I'll show you, I'll show you one, uh, here, and it's, it's a little dollhouse play structure for a kid. For those of you who don't know, this is actually, um, the headquarters of Explorer Scientific, so you're looking at his main shop floor right now. Look at this. This thing is so cute. Okay. It's a, a pop-up. Um, playhouse. You know, it's got a little curtain. It's got a, it's got a little door. Um, you you go into it from this side, and uh, you know it's it's it sets up in seconds. Okay, and I thought, well, gosh, can we make a can we make a big one? You know, and so that's what we did. <clears throat> because immediately I thought about putting a telescope inside. Of course you would. <laughs> right. And so, this is the whole. Uh, two-room observatory tent. Let me just tilt the camera up just a little bit. So my head's not completely chopped off. Here we go. Two-room observatory tent. And um, so this piece, this piece is a like a rain fly, okay, um, that goes over the entire structure. And the material is, uh, you know, weatherproof, um, completely blacked out. And um, so, you know, when you, you would use this when uh, you're not using your telescope, um, uh, you know, or you could use half of it to cover you in the, what I would call the, not the warm room, but, you know, where you put all your computers and stuff, your computer room, um, you'll get, uh, this is just the, one of the prototypes of it, but, you know, there are cords and stakes, this is the, Ports to help nail it down, uh, stakes. I would probably use, I would probably go to Harbor Freight though. I always like, you know, supersize everything and, re, you know, go and try to make it better than what it comes out with, uh, with originally. But this is, this is what, what they have as far as staking it down. And that does work, of course. Um, then there is, tent itself. Now this is, this side just has, this side has a Velcro seam right here, okay? And this allows us to attach it to the other, the other tent. Okay, so that's going to wrap around, here let me go around my telescope. my telescope and I've been using this so it's been a lot of fun it's been a lot of fun Tyler you want to help me yeah. this is a uh, Tyler Bowman hey Simon hey guys yeah. hey Ed yeah and so look how fast that is right and then we just pull it out from here and uh it's pretty big. <laughs> it's 50, 50 square feet. And then you just kind of put, put the Velcro pieces on. Can you see anything? Uh, yeah, we can, we can see one panel so far. Here, let me, let me bring the camera back a little bit. Let's see what that looks like. Yep, there we go. 
Is that better? Yeah. Yeah, okay, you can see it's tall, okay. Um, it's, uh, this is one of the prototypes, actually the final prototype has, has a taller lip. This is five feet tall. Two of the walls go up to six feet and are used as a, uh, for additional windbreak or, or a, uh, a light break, you know. But, uh, but the, gosh, I didn't plan on, I didn't plan this very well, Simon. Well, it's, it's bigger than you thought, put it that way. <laughs> I know how big it is, I designed it. But, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and this has, this has a door on this side, but the door on the final product, actually, this, this one came out to the side. The door now uh, zips from the bottom and then rolls up. Right. So, so you can go in, you know, and, uh, and that, that's where you're, you would set up your telescope or your uh, computers. I don't know what you can see inside here. But it's a five foot by five foot interior. Um, the, uh, you can see the telescope off to the side there. And the, the great thing about this whole structure is, is that this thing keeps dust and dirt and um, humidity and um, uh, the wind off your back, because it's the wind that's the real, the real uncomfortable part of this. You know, you can be in colder weather, but if it's windy, then uh, that becomes a problem. Yeah. And so you can see it now it's all, and you can take it all down. That rough got a whole done real good. There we go. Yeah, you got it. And then you just take it. You take it and you twist it, you know, and it all folds, it all folds up. It's kind of like that. And then you put that in the car. Okay, so now you have something that's really, really fast, really easy. Um, and uh, where did I put my chair? Oh, it's right here. So. So, you know, a lot of us, me included, okay, mm -hmm. uh, wanted to have a observatory or to be more comfortable. Uh, when I did some of my very first star parties, um, I would, uh, you know, I would uh, go out to the Anza Borrego State Park. I, would go, I went to a place called Little Blair Valley where I did a lot of my astronomy. And gosh, I mean, California deserts can get cold at night. Oh, like, yeah. 17, 12 degrees, you know, and if you're in California, that's for, you know, California, that's very, very cold weather. I know that it gets much colder uh, for a lot of people in different parts of the country, including way below zero. Um, I recommend that, that you set up the whole tent on maybe a tarp or some astroturf or something like that, um, just to uh, protect other things, because the other things that happen, this happened at Winter Star Party, was uh, ants, fire ants. You know, that happens at Okie Tex too. Yes. So, right? And so you're standing there with your telescope and suddenly your legs are stinging, okay? And uh, so it's, it's nice to not have something crawling up around you um, when you're observing with your telescope. And, uh, um, you know, if you have something down on the ground as well, this can help. Uh, you know, uh, prevent dew from forming on the instrument. So uh, if it's really dewy, uh, still you got to take precautions with dew zappers and that kind of thing. But, but uh, we'll, we'll really help. We'll really keep your equipment clean and, uh, and keep most of the wind off of you. If you're where it's really windy, you're going to want to anchor that, that, tel that tent down. And there are loops at the top and there's loops at the bottom. So you can anchor it at the bottom part and then you can have a strap that's coming down 
you know, from the top and, uh, and keep it, uh, you know, from, uh, blowing away, blowing over. Exactly. And if it's raining, then we've got a, a full oversized rain fly that goes over it. And, uh, and then that covers everything and your, your equipment's not going to get soaked. I mean, in all honesty, let's have a little bit of realism here. Um, if it is a gale force hurricane windstorm, you're not really going to be. Oh yeah. When it's knocking buildings down, it definitely will knock down the tent. <laughs> you know, what would be great though, is if, yeah, I mean, without being so mean, but everything else gets knocked down, but your tent still stands. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> and if five tornado comes through, rips up everything and then, yeah. I tent's still there. The scope's still gone. There. Yeah. The scope's gone, but the tent's no, still there. No. That's not going to happen, but it will keep, um, you know, it'll keep a, a, a nagging breeze off your yes. back. You know, uh, we're heading towards winter time. Uh, we are currently selling, uh, pre-selling the tent right now. It, it has a, uh, an MSRP price of two ninety nine. We did a regular introductory sale price of two forty nine, And if you join Explore Alliance, you can buy it for one ninety nine. Okay, which is another fifty bucks off. Uh, uh, that that membership uh, with the Explore Alliance gets you either a thirty dollar gift card or a hundred dollar gift card, and you can spend that hundred dollar gift card back on the tent if you want, um, or you know, and you can you can uh, and it's good at all of our dealers. So that's that's uh, uh, you know, it's a nice nice way to get into it to get a, uh, a fifty dollar discount even off the sale price and right. to be one of the first ones to have it so so um wh where can we find that again because somebody actually said we can't find it on your website really yeah in fact now i'm gonna go now and look for okay. it now let's see explore scientific um just do a search on our site and do observatory oh, okay. tent you should be able to find it Oh, find it. Oh yeah. Right yeah. off the bat. All right. That I'm going to post a link for you guys. Cause I'm sure you want to see it. Um, uh, yes, we will be selling it at telescopes.net as well. We're just waiting to get everything up onto our website. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, if you look at any other kind of structure, you could make one. I know people who do, they get PVC pipe, they get tarps, uh lots of yeah been uh, there been there <laughs> yeah yeah and it's it's um i mean it's fun you made it yourself you're probably going to spend what a hundred and some odd dollars in materials maybe maybe less if you have a bunch of pvc pipe laying around um but you know the, uh, having something that just pops up like that and then folds down like that that's pretty cool you know so well um, here's one thing that i can see um, I mean, this is when I, when I get my one, this is what I'm going to be using it for is solar. Um, now, the right. advantages of this here is this, a lot of people don't realize this, but it helps to actually be dark adapted when you're doing solar. I'm talking visual, not imaging. Um, when you're looking through the eyepiece and a lot of people I've seen during outreaches, they're struggling outside and they're trying to shield their faces up and they, you know, I, these cardboard things that they put onto the scopes and stuff like that. I mean, you can literally oh, do away with that in shade or something. Yeah. That's, right. So yeah, I mean, if you were inside of a darkened, uh, tent looking through it. You could do that. Um, you and I talked about that earlier Yes. and the, uh, possibility of taking the, uh, rain fly and putting a hole uh, in there that would snug up around the telescope tube. So we're gonna, we work with a, um, uh, a place that makes our, uh, our um, uh, Dobsonian shrouds, they're nearby. And so I'm gonna take one of these over and have that made. And I'll just give you one so that you can, uh, you can be one of our beta testers for that. I think they'll be, I think it'll work out pretty good. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, I guess the guy was searching on our website. Yeah, on telescopes not not net. It's not up yet because this is still a relatively new product um, that is uh, going through the whole works. So until we yeah, get yeah. it up on the site, that's right. Dealers are just now still placing orders for them. Yeah. We don't expect to have them until December. So, and a lot of a lot of retailers are hesitant to put anything up 
and, and I would agree with this uh, for most retailers, you know, unless you got it in hand, you know, don't put it up on the web because, you know, what do you get? You get, you'll get complaints, you know, so yeah, uh, we've already received some, well, why can I have it right now? But, you know, uh, one of the things that we promised to explore Alliance members is that we would give them early buy-in, a sneak peek at, at stuff like that. So we decided to go ahead and put it up on the web, make this program, of, you know, make this product available to them at a special price. And, um, you know, so it's, uh, um, you know, it's just a, a little advantage and makes it kind of fun for us too, you know, because, yeah. um, you know, we like to engage with the community, so. Well, I'm going to tell you now, uh, the chat is alive right now saying it's sold out. They're not out yet. When is it coming out? No, it, it will always say sold out because I don't have any in yet. Okay. I don't get them until December. Right. I don't get them until December. They yeah, are, they are, I think they're already manufactured. They may be on the water right now. Uh, when you put something on the water from, from Asia, it takes about 28 days, something like that to come over on a container. It's got to go through customs, you know, it goes through customs and then we got to put it in our warehouse and then we got to distribute it, you know, so. You know what I'm going to do is I'm going to hang around the port of LA waiting for a ex massive container saying Explorer Scientific and I'm just going to rob it right there. It'll be a big container ship that has Explorer, yep. Explorer Scientific on there. That's I'm just right. going to empty them real quick because right. just for you guys who don't know this, um, <laughs> any trades through China uh, for importing goods they have to land at the port of LA, um, from what I remember. Yeah, San Pedro. It's yep. San Pedro. That's right. So if you if you guys have ever been twitching, yeah, if you want to wondering, be early, you'll travel to yeah. San Pedro and wait at the port with Simon. <laughs> yeah, with a big stick going, where's my damn tin? That's right. Bring some beer or something for them, okay? So. Well, they'll probably just hand you the whole container at that point if you did that. <laughs> right. You so, know, Simon, it's a lot of fun to do these shows with you. <laughs> it is. It's it is. always fun. It is. It is. So the, what's sitting behind me here, this guy. Which one? That oh, guy. that's the uh, that, PMC-8. Yeah, this is my PMC-8. I've got an ED-102 on it. We have a customer coming in. Go, come on in. Come on in. Have, this store is actually open today. So uh, let me get Tyler for you. Okay. And let's see where he is. You guys just give me a moment, okay? Sure. Uh, Chris, am I drinking Coke Zero? We have a customer. Uh, where the hell is it advertised? There it is. Good. Yeah, so... Um, <clears throat> Coke Zero. Anyways, this, is, this has been my pet project, okay? Um, and uh, um, maybe it's better if I get on this side of it. Here we go. Uh, and this is a G11 with the PMC-8. I have a NUC computer on board here. A lot of people have been using like ASI Airs and this kind of thing, but uh, I, I just used, went with a powered USB hub and a NUC computer and um, Optech electric focuser is running it, uh, which works out very nicely. And um, uh, I'm using a QHY 163 camera on the back right there and then we got another QHY camera right here which is a um, uh, model 5 m2 I think is what it is auto guider yeah. yes and, the guider uh, yeah and uh, so that's an ed80 um, ed102 both in carbon fiber really lightweight you know um, used a lot mandy plate on the on the bottom beneath the cradle rings we did some cable management, which you can see, uh, although there's still a ton of cables on it. Um, I'm powering it with two uh, lithium type batteries. One's a lithium iron, the LifePo 4, I guess is what it's called. That's the one down here. And then on the other side, which you can't see, is a 20 volt uh, lithium battery for operating the uh, NUC computer. And the whole idea is that this thing can be operated remotely. Uh, over Zoom is how we're going to give people access to it. And um, you remember I was talking about these kids in uh, Nepal, mm -hmm. uh, they have no access to a telescope. That's, that's their telescope. We'll be setting it up for them. They'll be operating it remotely from Nepal. And uh, so that will uh, give them uh, access in the daytime while it's night here and they can actually run it in their classroom and all of that. So 
Um, can you, um, sorry, didn't mean to just um, interrupt. Can you talk a bit more about the Explorer Alliance membership? Because I've got somebody asking about that. Sure. Explorer Alliance membership has, um, uh, it, we created Explorer Alliance because Explorer Scientific, I mean, from day one, has done all kinds of educational outreach programs. We are the, uh, from day one, we were the under, underwriter for the Astronomical, the Astronomical League's uh, National Young Astronomers Award. We, since day one of the company, we were the underwriter for the uh, Astronomical League's uh, uh, Leslie Peltier Award, you know, for a lifetime of uh, astronomical um, contribution. Uh, the thing that's really cool, the, the NYAA, the National Young Astronomers Award, these kids that have won this uh, are high school students. They do, Simon, they do things like measure the radial velocity of black holes uh, in high school. I don't even do that. <laughs> right. <laughs> really brilliant. I don't care what age they are, brilliant people, okay? Um, and uh, for a while, McDonald Observatory was involved. And McDonald Observatory, in the early days of this program, was giving them a lifetime pass to the observatory. So you can imagine, lifetime pass to McDonald Observatory, uh, one of the darkest sites in, in North America, uh, major size telescopes. I mean, they have what, a 107 inch telescope, they have the Hobby Eberly telescope, they have, uh, you know, it, it is, it's a major research institution. Um, and uh, the, the winners of that were getting lifetime access. Professional astronomers do not not get lifetime access to this thing. Okay, so that's, it was a big deal. Um, I don't know if they still do it or not. Um, but from the Explore Scientific side, what we do is we give them, uh, we pay to fly them out to the award ceremonies. Um, and uh, they get, uh, the winner gets an ED-127 airspace triplet from Ooh. us. Okay, that's, that's the first place winner. The second place winner gets one of our uh, five inch uh, AR doublets. Okay. Okay, and uh, you know, complete on the whole mount and everything ready to go, um, and um, and then they get this beautiful plaque and everything. But these kids have gone on to be. Uh, we've been doing it for a while now, and I did it also when I was at Mead. So I've seen these kids. You were calling me dad, okay? Mm -hmm. I've seen these kids <laughs> go on to become doctors, scientists, surgeons. You know, aerospace engineers. I mean, it's just amazing it's amazing you know and and it, it it makes you really uh happy to know that you've had some like an inspiration point for them you know and that you celebrated what they do and and uh what they know you know so that that's the cool thing about it you can't take responsibility for it because you know they're doing this under their own power they would be these kinds of people anyway but um i do believe that when you recognize people for their accomplishments and um you make it special so it's inspiring to them. I, I think that takes people a long ways because it doesn't take a lot of inspiration to make someone to make someone change their whole life, you know? I mean, if, it's, they are, if they're inspired, they, they, and that's what everybody's looking for. And astronomy, I, I, I think this is why you're into it, Simon. Mm -hmm. uh, there are so many inspirational points about it. Every day we can open up Google News and type in astronomical discovery, you know what? Almost every day you're going to find some new astronomical discovery that's happened. Well, we are know, in the golden age of astronomy right now. And, right. Uh, and it is very inspiring. And, and it's inspiring from even if you're walking into a, a hundred year old observatory dome to listening to some uh, you know, uh, Nobel Prize winning scientists like Kip Thorne or something talking about LIGO and gravity waves to, you know, we, we have this 10 year old girl, uh, her name's Libby, uh, her nickname's Libby in the Stars, to hear her passion about seeing the, the rings of Saturn. You know, so it's just uh, astronomy and, and these inspiration points, I have to say, for anybody, they're good for you. They put you in a frame of mind that is uh, very positive. And it makes all your problems shrink down 
And then when you look through a telescope and you see out galaxies out in the vastness of space, what, your problems shrink down again because <laughs> you realize you're on this neat little tiny planet out there, okay? Uh, and it's you know, good for you. It is just good for you overall. Yes. Yeah. The more you could do of it, the better it is. And that's, that's you know, why I'm The I thing is, it. though, the, the big thing about uh, astronomy in the last six months, at least for me anyway, has been people have been searching for something to do with based upon the problems that we're going through with the COVID-19 and all that kind of stuff. And yeah. astronomy has taken off more so than ever before. And I think this is great. Like you said, we are in a golden age. And I don't want to paint at this in because it's a negative point, but we're almost at the peak of that golden age because of this COVID that so many people want to buy a telescope now. And well, that, that, that's just in the amateur astronomy, right? Arena, or maybe for us that sell gear, okay? We're, we're the outfitters of, of the amateur astronomers, right? So mm -hmm. uh, I'm one of them, you're one of them. All of our competition is involved in outfitting people for this adventure, you know? And this adventure really is about personal exploration and personal discovery. Because the first time you find you know, NGC 253 and look at it and see this galaxy that's so beautiful to look at. Uh, and, you're, and you realize how far away it is and you realize you're seeing fossil photons hitting your eye. I mean, it's, it is the kind of contact. Um, these kinds of things uh, give you a, an awakening. They humble, they humble people because the magnification of all the junk that you hear on the internet and on the news about our whatever we think our problems are, are almost nothing compared to what's going on in the cosmos, you know? Oh, of course. Right? I mean, it's great to see that they got that, um, uh, the asteroid, which they, they punched it. Oh, uh, Banyu. Yeah. yeah. Wasn't that and then cool? All that and all that stuff came up. And I was reading yeah. today that they were actually saying that they were almost a victim to their own success because they've got too much material and they can't close oh. the damn thing. Oh, really? I got, yeah. a, I got a little video of that. You can see it. Here it is. Oh, They're there it is. Down, coming down. And boom. <laughs> Look how fast it was. Yeah. And they just touched, they just touched for what, maybe one or two seconds? Maybe one second, maybe a fraction of a second. So that, yeah, so they're going to be bringing all of that material that they collected back to Earth. Uh, I think yeah. it lands in 2023. So mm -hmm. and it land in the Utah desert. So for anybody who lives in Utah, please don't hang around the desert waiting for this thing to drop on your head. <laughs> or bring bring a lot of water with you. Oh, yeah, you know? that too. That's or right. a <laughs> Um. So yes. I've got. Um, what was it? Uh, you obviously do all these live events, which we obviously we or um, I was a part of uh, a handful yeah, of them. On, we did the several com of them. combined yes. one, uh, mm -hmm. which was actually a lot of fun. Um, tell me, what gave you this idea of doing this global network and, and the, 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 the the star party? Because well, you know, my uh, this is not a new idea. The, these these no, it's kinds not new, of things. But... It's not new. A lot of people have been doing them. Uh, and so I, I reflected on, you know, well, gosh, you know, the, it should be done more. Okay. Um, I didn't realize what I was biting off at the time because I said, oh, we'll, we'll go on live every day and we'll have a show for 30 minutes or an hour. And then once a week, we'll do a global star party. Arranging the global star party is, is a little tough because I mean, just try to get anybody to go to any party, okay? Uh, any meeting. Uh, the tough part is schedules. Yes. Everybody's that's so the busy problem. these days, you know? And um, so, uh, and we run this show for about four or five hours on, on a Tuesday night. And then sometimes on Friday afternoons, starting at about four o'clock, we do a European edition. And Christopher Go has agreed to me to be a. a um, uh, a co-host for our Asian edition. So we're going to have basically three editions of the Global Star Party. Uh, I'm why do I get? Why do I get the feeling you're going? I'm going to get a call saying, "Can you do the Asian edition?" <laughs> 
Now, why would I do that, Simon? <laughs> This is like, I'm screwed because I live here in the U.S. Uh, I'm <laughs> also right. from the U.K., so I'm, I'm hey, in the you got European. a cool accent, and you're Asian. Yep. So. And I'm Asian, and now you're going to get me in that. <laughs> and you have a lot of telescopes. <laughs> yeah, and I have a lot of telescopes. Exactly. So this is like... Well, you're certainly welcome. I'm not going to try to drag you in kicking and screaming, okay? So. No, you know, I'm gonna, you know I'm good to show up most of the time. Oh, yeah. Well, it would be cool. You know, one of the really cool dynamic things of doing a global star party is that you have northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere astronomers either talking, sharing their images, showing how to do image processing live, or, or if they got clear skies and everything's all hooked up, because uh, that's what this thing can do, okay? You just, you're sharing the live view of images coming down in your scope. And so Simon uh, has done several of these things with us with uh, solar imaging. And, you know, he's so knowledgeable and so good at controlling his telescope that, uh, you know, he was able to, to walk the entire perimeter of the sun, you know, just, I, I can, I was trying to imagine him, you know, just uh, hitting the buttons and, and doing that without overshooting or anything. So he did a very, very good job with that. Um, you know, it's just, Simon's professional at uh, handling a camera and, um, and, you know, a pro, really pro level at handling a telescope too. And so, uh, uh, it was great to have him on there. Um, the sun, even as quiet as it has been, in H Alpha, there's still all kinds of stuff oh, going yeah. on. Oh yeah, you know, right? Oh so, yeah. So uh, it was uh, it was great. So we we had live images of the sun coming down. While in Europe, like in Spain or in the UK, we have live images coming down of things at night at the same time. Uh, and then we would get, you know, have someone in the Southern Hemisphere. We've had uh, people in Australia. We've had people, more often than not, in South America, okay, uh, uh, chiming in and uh, uh, either able to show something through their telescope or to talk about uh, how they get people involved in astronomy down there. So it's, um, it's really cool. And the thing that everybody remarks about is how unifying uh, amateur astronomy is. And, um, uh, you know, and how, and, you know, every, every show I get somebody that has watched it from somewhere in the world and tells me how inspired they are. I always ask them to come on the show. Um, many people are shy to do that, but uh, uh, thank goodness uh, uh, some of them do. And, and so we've got this, uh, this little group in Nepal that I'm working with right now. Um, uh, with uh, Deep T, who's uh, 16 years old, she's 16. She heads up her own high school astronomy club, um, and uh, so there's uh, in the and she's she's sharing this. I think her whole club watched it. Maybe other friends in school watched it, and uh, so it's uh, uh, it's very very cool. It's very yeah. cool, and I hope that uh, more young people actually uh, watch it and want to get involved in Global Star Party. But anybody can get involved. You know, you got something you really want to share, and you can do it in about 10 minutes, you know, and you're not going to take over the whole show. Uh, you know, we certainly will give you a stage. You know, I'm still waiting. Uh, and, and like I said, I've watched some of these, and I've been in some of these. I'm still twitching to wait for somebody to do a live uh, stack of the southern sky so I can actually see things like the large and small uh, Magellanic Cloud or oh, the Tarantula. Yeah. It's... The killer part is, is this bugs me. I was in Australia a long, long time ago, and we're wandering around a place called uh, Cottesloe Beach, which uh, for those of you who live anywhere in Australia will know where that is. It's in Perth. So mm. I mean, I'm looking up and I'm saying to my friend, oh, look, Orion's upside down. And I didn't really know what I was looking at because I wasn't into it back then. But there mm. I am staring at all of these things oh. that I've never seen before. Mm. And, you know, now that I'm in... The situation where I know what I'm doing, I wish I knew what I knew back you know, now back then. I was like, I, I'm dying to see the southern sky in so many ways because they have things that we haven't seen mm. for most of us. Mm -hmm. And that's what I liked about this global star party is, is I'm just twitching, waiting for that person to go, oh, we finally got a clear day. Boom, there it is. Right. You know, this is not some uh, pre-processed thing that they've shot for the last 20 hours. Oh, I yeah. want to see five minute stub right there and then yeah or even like a wide field shot of the moon yeah way uh 
That may be possible with uh, Rodrigo Zaleda. He lives near, he lives in La Serena. You mm -hmm. go outside La Serena 10 minutes, it's jet black. I mean, it's dark, dark. They, they, La Serena and Chile, they, the whole city is all about how wonderful their, their skies are. They, they, they treasure their dark sky heritage there. And, um, you know, and just, just an hour away is uh, uh, the, the CTIO observatory complex where they have, uh, you know, all these major telescopes. Um, Gemini 2, I think, is down there as well. So, mm -hmm. um, and I saw the total eclipse from there in, in 2019. So it's uh, a first rate observatory complex. And man, to see the Milky Way, I, 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 thought I, I thought I knew the Milky Way. You go down to the Southern Hemisphere, you realize that you ain't seen the Milky Way yet, okay? I know. the Milky Way from the Southern Hemisphere is mind-blowing. Well, that's right, because they actually see the, um, the large part of the galactic core, whereas we only see the top half of it. You see the um, top half, you see where it kind of, the bulge getting out towards Sagittarius, you yeah. know. And, but and, that's, uh, that's all we get to see. Right. I'm you telling go you. down there and you, you do see the large and small Magellanic clouds. Uh, uh, you can see lots of nebula naked eye. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's stunning. It's stunning. And, and uh, to see it like that is, um, you know, I often say this, but to see the Milky Way like that, uh, either in the northern or southern hemisphere, gives you this feeling of, that you're experiencing something that's very sacred, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think a lot of people feel that. So I think almost all astronomers feel that. Well, for, for the, us in the Northern Hemisphere, it's like the Holy Grail. I mean, I, I, I almost want to know what do the people in the South think of the Northern sky? Because you don't really hear that conversation, do you? A little bit you do because there's no, things that they've never seen. The North. There's well, stuff they haven't seen in from the southern hemisphere, you know. So there are we we have some some objects, some galaxies, some nebula. It, of course, they can see the Orion Nebula, right? Because it's right. it's right on the equator, pretty much. Um, uh, but um, for well, either stuff like side, I mean, you you do get about what sixty or seventy percent of the whole sky, right? Yeah, I don't. Oh. They can't see things like the Pelican, um, the Seder right. region. Right, uh, North American the Ring Nebula, Nebula, maybe yeah, they can't um, see that. Right, the veil. Right. I mean, we. The difference in 51, here is in fifty-one. They oh, don't yes. see. Right. I mean, M81, the big difference M82. that we get is, I, I guess, we get to see out of the arm to a certain extent because if you're imaging in the winter, people think that the Milky Way is gone. It's not gone. It's still there but you see a different part of the disc that runs above and it's not very well, it's not shot very often. Yeah. Um, but when you do, it's actually super fascinating because you get this complete flipped view of looking out of the Milky Way hmm. and people forget we're on a, an arm looking out, not in. Uh, right. So yeah. it, it, it's like a whole different thing. Right. Uh, what time is it now? Okay, so we're probably pretty much coming up to the end. Okay. Because, uh, you know, if you know Scott and probably if you know me, we, we will. Why talk. was I on, the, I on the show again? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we will talk. <laughs> what was the topic we were long. going to cover? <laughs> well, we no, it was wonderful, it was wonderful to be on your show, Simon, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, thank you for letting me show some of my gear. That's very cool. Um, uh, but uh, the most important part of any of these shows is, um, you know, to get out and to explore and to do it any way that you can. Uh, it is also very important to, to connect with the community any way that you can. Um, mm -hmm. Whether you're doing, you know, uh, Explore Alliance is our way of, of connecting people here, but there are many wonderful programs, you know, Night Sky Network, which, by the way, we are now a member of is another one of them. Uh, uh, the Astronomical League uh, has now gone global, and um, so I'm working with them on that. They're, by the way, they're going to have, um, they're going to have, uh, I think they're going to do weekly programming for their members. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. So I, they've asked me to, uh, to do that, and uh, so I'm volunteering for the league to make that happen, you know, so. You're a busy man. I'm a busy man. 
Now you know why we will call you dad. What else am I going to do? This is this is it. You know, I I I signed up for this a long time ago. You know, so I I love it and I love sharing the sky. Anybody that's done educational outreach or astronomy outreach uh, knows the the energy and juice you get from that. Okay, it's it's actually a very in that way it's a very selfish thing to do because it makes it really. It, it gives you something that you can't buy. It is really amazing. No, it's true. So, you know, yeah. it's funny because I gave um, one of the guys that do your live stream um, the mono camera, and it was great. Oh, right. Uh, it was Shailendra Sharma. I was yes. so that was Simon is incredibly generous, you know, and for him just to send the camera out to uh, the UK. All right, it wasn't like it was ex a, a cheap shipment either, you know. Uh, but he was, you know, this guy has been trying to take his astrophotography to the next level. He didn't have a very good camera, didn't have a really, didn't have an astro camera. He, no. I think he's using a DSLR or something, yep. and, which is fine. You can do a lot of stuff with that. But an astro camera, wow, now you can start to do some real cool stuff. He was on our last show on Friday and was showing uh, some narrowband stuff he was doing. And uh, he was the only guy that wasn't clouded out around the world <laughs> that was see, on our show. Do you and see he was the getting difference? getting data down through that. So. Right, but you see the difference that it, it I mean, uh, okay, it only made the difference for one person, I guess, because I can't send everybody a camera, but. No, 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 it, it, it didn't because he shared it with the whole world. Exactly. On party. That, yeah. that was the thing, because yeah. that was one of the parts that, you know, when, when you see somebody doing this, uh, and I've, I've watched people do astronomy uh, for so long now, um, mm -hmm. in the time that I've been doing this. And the one thing I hate is watching somebody struggle with the setup. And it's not because they don't have money. I mean, of course, people uh, can buy this stuff there on their own, but they have that fear. And I like to stand there and be that person that breaks the fear. That's why I came up with the name Stupid Astronomer, because I do the stupid things so you don't have to. But with uh, Chocks... You've already done them all. <laughs> I know. With Chocks... Um, I, I, I got some to add to your list, but okay. okay. <laughs> with, well, with Chocks, I had to get him into that and, and say to him, it's like, look, dude, there is more to it. Because yeah. he, he made this comment saying, I'm, I'm perfectly happy with just using this camera. So, no, you're not, because I'm going to give you this and you're actually going to have a go at this. Yeah, when yeah. You see it, it's going to be a game changer. Sorry, that's yeah. Adam Fox's cat, so he's going to be on in just a moment. Okay. And then um, there was somebody else who I gave my old uh, VX mount and my refractor, um, which was one of those big doublet Acromat refractors, mm -hmm. because I saw her struggling with this rickety old scope. And, you know, I'm not going to name who it is because I don't want to call him out. Uh, <laughs> and. <laughs> I had a rig, rickety old scope at one yeah, point. Yeah, I, I don't want to mention the company, that's all. Okay. All so right. Anyway, it's not you, thank God. Hmm. But um, the only reason why I gave it to her is, you know, because she was so into it, I into the astronomy side of things, but was mm -hmm. just used to using this thing and wanted to put a camera onto it. Now, yes, I could have given her a camera as well, but, you know, baby steps type scenario. I thought, no, you know what, let's start you off with a scope and see what happens and see how that progresses for her and yeah. i'll tell you one thing now what she's doing uh, and the inspiration that it's created from her is just been so worth it just like it's been worth it to do it with chocks and i've done it with other people in fact somebody's watching the stream right now um his name's mac i gave him the solar max 90. oh that's cool and that's he's great. been having a lot of fun you gave him a solar max 90. well i got that from mead um initially and a coronado 90 yeah coronado solar max 90 yeah 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 wow and i just sat there and sat there because i started using the daystar quark um so somebody else could basically play with it i mean the yeah. golden rule that i've always said to people is um if i give you something you cannot sell it but when you're bored of it pass it on to the next person yeah that's good man so that's at some point karma. Yeah, that's 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 how this that's should astro work. That's astrokarma right there. Yeah, that's how it should work. At some point in time, someone is going to end up with one of my scopes because when I get bored yep. of it, I just go, "You, it's your problem now. Have fun." And I that just That is run off. way better than guys that have 20, 30 telescopes in their garage and they only use three or four of them. Okay. There, if you know what, if their wives were listening to this live stream right now, they'd be going like, "Clear out the garage." 
<laughs> Clear it out. Yeah. There are people that need your telescope. That's right. Exactly. Well, I, I, I really admire you for that, uh, Simon. You know, and, I, uh, you know, there should be uh, more people that think that way, you know, because uh, you're, you're paying it forward, and, um, and that's great. And you, you know, uh, becoming scientifically more literate helps people in so many ways so many ways they get uh, the ability to take on more um, challenging jobs more technical jobs better paying jobs they're mm -hmm. sought after more uh, they're able to help more people so yep come on in hey can you tell me where sam's furniture moved to sam's furniture well this was the old sam's furniture building they moved across <laughs> the street kind of down this way so if you go on the 49 you can see them Oh boy, that was that was just classic. That just happened. <laughs> All right, Scott. Somebody needs furniture. <laughs> yeah, maybe you should start selling furniture as well. Right. Well, you technically you do, but you know we'll get That's into right, that another yeah. one. Astro furniture. I see Adam Block is on right now. He's waiting in the wings. So nice to see you again, Adam. Uh, but uh, yeah, um, uh, thank you nice for letting time. me be on your show, and yeah. good luck and. And um, you guys got, uh, you know, Blockbuster astrophotographer coming up here, Adam Block. So it's going to be awesome. Talk to you later. All right. See you later, Bye -bye. Scott. Bye-bye. All right, guys. Um, we are just going to literally run off for a two-second break. i got to go to the bathroom and get my cat off my lap for a moment. Um, and then we will basically pretty much get started with Adam and his talk because I, I want to concentrate because he he's actually talking about something that I really want to know um, the interpretation of astronomical images and I've spoke to you Adam before about this and you kind of know that I like to look at images to figure out what's in front what's behind so I'm looking forward I, to this I, I, that's good although I think we need to there's a shift in what this talk is it's not no I know that. I know I know what it is I did okay. I did check up on it but okay. I know that I like the uh, technical maybe that'll be questions for for after <laughs> yeah, you know I like the technical sides of it. I'm not just here's a pretty picture, here's yeah. another pretty picture. Yeah, you I know understand. where I'm going. I know where you're going, but you're going to the bathroom now, so go. For That's that. exactly right. So we'll okay. be right back. All right. Ah. All right, my break's over, so we are now back. So, Adam, 
you are going to be talking about integration, uh, sorry, um, yeah, integration of astronomical images, oh, sorry, interpretation, what was it, integration, interpretation of astronomical images. So for those of you who don't know who Adam Block is, you know, I seriously suggest that you check out some of his stuff. He is probably one of the foremost experts in Pixinsight, I would say. Um, he probably would disagree, but I would say he's definitely up there on the top level. Way above me, I'll tell you that much for sure. Even half the stuff I don't even know about. So uh, without any more delay, let's get going with all of this because I'm going to start taking notes on this because I, I saw a quick um, <laughs> sneak preview and I didn't want to go through the whole thing because it will ruin it. Um, so I'm ready. Okay. All right. Well then I'm, I am going to preface it a little bit by saying that this presentation was made for a, a general talk for the public. Um, because I think that many people don't appreciate certain elements of astrophotography. For example, people think that they're snapshots, but not only that it's when you look at an image, they look, like abstract forms usually, but there's more to it in, in terms of you know what you see, the differences between one image and another in terms of the kind of image, say broadband images compared to narrow band, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, the other thing about this particular presentation is that um, it was also the genesis for another thing that I worked on recently, which is a, an article for Sky and Telescope magazine that'll be published uh, I think in the January issue. So this is all kind of a just a hot topic for me right now, uh, but this is more the, the general public version of that talk. And maybe at the end, if you have more detailed, advanced, I don't know, deeper questions about things, then, then we, can, we can do that. So with, with that preface, then I will begin first, I guess, by sharing the screen. Yep. Yep. Cat's like desperate to be a part of this show. <laughs> Yes, I don't think I need this. Um, so you should just see blackness there. Oh, yes. I know what I want to do. The other thing I want to do is, uh, maybe I can't do this. Uh, I apologize. I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. One thing I do, I'll come back at the end. I am going to, hmm, I'm looking figure this out. Oh, I'm doing the wrong thing. I'm going to turn my, just a background on. So we're not going to see me. We're going to see, I don't know, something. I don't know what. Here, let me pick something interesting. Well, my cat. My cat will have to do. Oh, we'll do this one. It's kind of a Southwest theme. There you go. Now I'm happy. I'm ready to go. All right. So as I mentioned, this is the interpretation of astronomical images, which I claim is a difficult thing to do. There are few other kinds of images. I mean, there certainly are, but they're, astronomical images are tough by comparison compared to other things that you look at to really know what you see. So have you ever seen a, a beautiful picture of space, perhaps a nebula or a galaxy, and wondered if the colors are real or how big it appears in the sky? Many pictures of the cosmos seem abstract and removed from our daily experience. The irony is that pictures of space capture that which is most common and ubiquitous. It is our daily life on Earth that affords us a uniquely special view. You see, the problem is when looking at astrophotography, there are no people or easily identifiable references to orient oneself. Yes, the abstract form of a nebula can be beautiful without further consideration. But if you saw a picture of a person that was green, or they stood taller than a house, you would instantly reassess the information that picture communicates. There's a similar skill set that can be applied to astrophotographs, and that is what I'd like to show. So with that in mind, join me on a journey through space and time and revel in the beauty of the universe. We live in a world of images and our digital lives rely on our ability to interpret them. It is a skill honed by countless hours in front of screens big and small. However, some kinds of images, especially those that depict 
tremendous scales of size or time defy our ability to easily interpret them. So the images that I'm showing here, these were all taken by me with exceptions to the images that I'll label. You'll see that there are a number of um, HST pictures as well as a, a few others that I show. These images were not chosen randomly. They exhibit what inspires the most commonly asked question, what are the sparkles or lines emanating from the stars? Some people think that they're put there for artistic reasons. Others don't question their appearance in photographs because it meets an expectation of what a star should look like based on drawings or cartoons. These patterns are indeed artifacts produced by certain telescope designs. Reflecting telescopes that use mirrors have structures that hold secondary mirrors or other instruments. These rods or veins obstruct small amounts of light that enter the telescope and through a process called diffraction, the light rays are scattered. These so-called diffraction spikes are not desirable and some form of diffraction will always occur for any obstruction. The images shown so far have been produced by a particular telescope on top of Mount Lemmon, this one. This is the Schulman telescope, and it's, it's the primary telescope at the UA Mount Lemmon Sky Center. This telescope is available to take images with, just like the ones you've seen here. You can see the veins that support the secondary mirror at the top. Notice how this image, produced with a telescope that uses only lenses, has no diffraction patterns. There are no obstructions to cause it. Most large telescopes use mirrors because it's not advantageous, or in many cases even possible, to build telescopes made only of glass lenses. This is why most professional images have diffraction patterns. On a more philosophical note, notice how the light of stars is spread into a spectrum of its colors. The diffraction of light into its component wavelengths is the primary way most astronomical measurements are made. Even though these are artifacts, the fundamental information is literally encoded in these images. It's as if the universe wants us to discover the answers if we only look hard enough and ask the right questions. Scintillating diffraction patterns are only but a superficial element of astronomical images. There are deeper considerations of what is recorded in a picture. Typically, CCD cameras that are optimized for astrophotography are very sensitive and can record many tens of thousands of discrete brightness levels. Computer monitors, by comparison, only display 255 grayscale levels. An astrophotographer must then choose how to represent and render the data recorded in an image. This is a picture of a wonderful spiral galaxy. And although its splendor is recorded in the data, these values are being rendered in its unstretched form with the monitor only displaying the very first few hundred brightness levels. By changing the white and black points, more of the data can be visualized. Now we see a galaxy in the center with some spiral structure as well as a few other galaxies in the background. Finally, by representing the data in a nonlinear way, the faintest values displayed are proportionally brighter than the other elements of the image where they were already bright. However, even more of the story of this field can be revealed. Now we see the faint spiral arms as well as the tidal tails of other interacting galaxies. When looking at an astrophotograph, keep in mind that the person who creates the image consciously decides this element of representation as well as many others, as we'll see. Blend in the color information and the image takes on new dimensions of light. Notice how I chose to display the faintest and noisiest features as delicately hinted. This communicates that those features are truly difficult to see relative to the other elements of the image. The colors represented in astrophotography come in a few major variations. The images you've seen in this video so far all record the visible wavelengths of light. However, this is only a small fraction of the electromagnetic spectrum and astronomers pursue the entire span of energies that can be detected with instrumentation. With regards to the light that we perceive with our eyes, 
even if looking through the largest telescopes in the world, the universe would not appear with the vibrant colors shown in these images. Our biology is simply not designed to detect these minuscule quantities of light. A full color image of visible light is created with a camera with filters that discriminate between reddish light, greenish light, and bluish light. These pictures are called broadband images, and when the images are assembled, the colors of light are mixed together in a way that is analogous to what our brains do. So in a picture like this, I do not choose that this should be blue or this part be red. If your eyes were as sensitive as the camera that was used and you could expose for as long, this is approximately what you would see. Sometimes people ask if an image such as this is enhanced in terms of color. I take a different perspective and explain that it is our view of the universe with eyeballs which is diminished. If you look through any telescope in the world to this object, you would not see any color in this nebula. Yet red and blue wavelengths of light would truly be hitting your eye. In this sense then, this picture isn't an enhancement, but instead a more accurate portrayal of reality. And these instruments become our surrogate senses that allow us to understand the world around us. Another kind of color representation is done through narrowband imagery. This method compares light of specific wavelengths which results in a high contrast image of nebular features. However, this isn't a true full color image because all of the other wavelengths of light are not included. Here's a broadband image of the Eagle Nebula with the very famous pillars of creation in the center. These pillars were made famous by the iconic Hubble Space Telescope picture of them. The HST picture is a narrow band image Note the wavelengths that were used were just one green part and two red bits. These were then mapped as red, green, and blue, resulting in a mapped narrow band image, which is an arbitrary color assignment. As you can see, the HST picture of the Eagle Nebula is just a small portion of a much larger object. This leads us to the important ideas of resolution and field of view. When looking, when looking at astrophotographs, each pixel of a sensor detects light from a, just a very small patch of the sky. So I have a, uh, just a raw image here to show just the tiny patch of sky. The size of this area on the sky determines the finest resolution of an image. First, a quick review of angular dimensions. A degree, perhaps the size of your fingertip at arm's length, can be divided into 60 arc minutes. The moon subtends one half a degree on the sky, so it is approximately 30 arc minutes across. A crater on the moon might be several arc minutes in size. An arc minute can again be divided into 60 arc seconds. So a bump on the crater on the moon might be of this size. Taken together, the array of pixels determines the field of view. The HST picture of the pillars is only a few arc minutes in dimension, whereas the field of view of the picture from the Schulman telescope is 10 times larger, though this is still smaller than the diameter of the moon. However, something deceptive is at play here. Each pixel of the HST image sees a tiny 0.05 square degrees of the sky, square arc seconds, sorry, of the sky. Whereas a, a pixel in my image covers a patch of sky just six times larger. So before I show a one-to-one -one comparison, there are some important rules of thumb to know about optical astronomy. First, uh, stars are so far away that they're not resolved and are truly points of light. However, as light passes through our atmosphere, the rays are deviated by small amounts. We live in an ocean of air, and our view of space from the ground is a little blurry. Typically, this blurriness smears images by one to two arc seconds. So with this, we now know enough to start interpreting images of all kinds. Let's begin with this wide field image of the region of sky near the Orion Nebula. This image was acquired uh, with an astrograph, this one, 
And each pixel at the back of this telescope sees five arc seconds of sky. Recall that stars are points and the atmosphere blurs images by two arc seconds, which is smaller than five. This means that the stars in this image look a little pixelated, uh, like little squares. The special name for this situation is called being undersampled. Now we'll overlay a, the region of sky captured by the Schulman telescope and zoom in to the Orion Nebula, at least the central part of it. Due to the increased scale, we can clearly see more details and the stars are now blurred across many pixels. Finally, we can overlay the HST image and see things at their intrinsic resolution. The stars are nearly pixel-like and undersampled again. The fine details here are due more to the fact that the telescope is above the Earth's blurring atmosphere than it is due to the optics of HST. Did you notice that the HST picture is not a full color image? One giveaway is that most nebula have glowing clouds of gas that are pink or red. All their variations with multiple pastel hues are a good sign that the image is composed of mapped colors. Another thing to consider is that we now have two images with stars that are undersampled, both the wide field image and the HST image. So how in general can you tell the difference? The easiest way to know is to look at the size of the features of the object. If they are large compared to the field of view, it is most likely a larger space-based telescope image. Wide field images um, have small stars, but they also have small details. Finally, no matter what kind of astrophotograph you're looking at, the stars in the image will appear to vary in size. Stars are points, but all telescopes, even ones in space, create images in which light is spread out due to diffraction. The brighter the star, the more of the scattered starlight you see. So sizes of stars in a given image only signify brightness, not true dimensions. Take, for example, this wide field image of Betelgeuse. This star actually fits in one pixel on this sensor, but the bright glow of the scattered light can be seen to spill across hundreds of pixels. <clears throat> so let's use our skills to identify a few different types of images. First, we'll start with what might be a tricky image. This is a broadband image of one of the most colorful regions of the sky. Basically, each nebula type is shown here. There's red emission from glowing hydrogen gas near the star on the right and more in the lower left corner. The top of the frame is dominated with a bluish scattered light from dust. This is called a reflection nebula. And then finally, dark clouds of dust obscure the view except where they thin and then they show golden hues especially near Antares, which adds some of its own yellow-orange light. This is literally the palette of a large majority of diffuse nebulae. Can you tell if this image was taken with a large telescope yielding a high-resolution image, or is this instead a wide-field image with undersampled stars and lower-resolution details? If you said a wide-field image, you, you got it right. This is a four-by-eight-degree region of the sky. You could fit 64 moons in this field of view. Galaxies such as these are so far away that only our imaginations can span the distances. As such, when we look at galaxies, we see great averages of information. The combined light of stars and nebulae and other galaxies lends itself to low contrast details and colors because many things appear mixed together. For this reason, it's unusual to see mapped color images of galaxies, except perhaps for those that are our nearest neighbors. Here's a broadband image of M82 with an enhancement in the hydrogen alpha emission 
that corresponds to the color of the red filaments of gas being expelled from this starburst galaxy. The colors are the same without enhancement, but by adding more signal uh, for this particular feature, the added contrast makes the image more compelling. When mapped colors are employed, the result is obvious and can highlight structures of galaxies. Here, radio wavelengths of light are mapped to trace the, uh, as blue, to trace the cool molecular clouds of hydrogen gas and show the skeleton of the galaxy. Here's a broadband image of the same galaxy. This is a full color image of what is effectively a narrowband object. This is a dying star that has lost its outer layers of gas. Our own sun may eventually end its life billions of years from now in a similar way. The sphere of gas fluoresces this characteristic blue-green color due to small amounts of oxygen in the nebula. This process always yields this color, which is why the HST picture of the same is an example of, mapped color, uh, of a mapped color image with its expected you know, extraordinary detail. Here's another image. Is this a mapped color image? What about the resolution? What kind of telescope lightly uh, generated this data? Well, this is definitely a mapped color image. And note that the details are quite large. The difficulty is that many images are not posted at their intrinsic resolution. Even an HST picture like this can look like something a small telescope from the ground can do. But when the full image is shown, the image characteristics become obvious. Finally, how about this one? Is, what kind of image is this? This is another mapped color image, uh, but this time it really is a wide field image taken with a small telescope. While the colors and resolution of an astrophotograph are generally image attributes that can be seen directly, many other aspects of the processing that takes place to produce an image are not obvious. Certain kinds of digital processing leave characteristic artifacts or other telltale signs. However, the important idea is that images of space are not snapshots. Raw data is typically dark, colorless, and perhaps uninteresting. An astrophotograph then is the sum of hundreds of processing choices that are made to render the final image. Given the same data, different people will end up with different results. I'd like to highlight just a few tiny such considerations to give a taste of what these decisions look like. When the initial raw data is displayed, it's possible to identify colors or details that are desirable to have be represented in the final image. Many processing choices will blunt the effort or make it an unattainable goal. Seeing the final image in your mind and processing the data in small methodical steps helps to stay on course. In this image, each of these features were observed early on and uh, maintained with every subsequent processing step. CCD sensors produce linear data that exceeds a monitor's ability to display everything at once. So nonlinear ways of displaying tonal variations are crucial. Without the use of high, high dynamic range algorithms, the interesting features of this galaxy could not be displayed. Note that the inner disk with bluish tips and thin dust lanes as well as the outer distortions in the galaxy's halo are now more easily visible. In fact, these kinds of decisions are not unlike what Ansel Adams would make when he adjusted the tonal values of his images. What interested him was not what he saw in his camera, but instead what he pre-visualized in his mind as a final image. He would then dodge and burn his film to achieve his vision. With astrophotographs, typically these adjustments are applied globally, or if selectively, they are conditionally applied based on thresholds of brightness, color, or contrast. High contrast in particular is an image attribute that is preferred by both image makers and image viewers alike. There is an ancient evolutionary preference for high contrast, and this preference is shared cross-culturally. Adams, of course, knew this, and played with it in his photography. The same lessons apply to astrophotography, but with some caveats. 
take this image of the Trifid Nebula. Which version do you find most compelling? There's no right or wrong answer. There are simply just different choices. However, there are consequences for the choices that are made. And that is something to be appreciated. If you didn't guess, my image is the one on the left. Although I could cater to the sugar high that contrast gives, I don't because it comes with a cost. Light that filters through the clouds of dust has a subtle attenuation and depth, which I feel is lost and, and flattens with the opaqueness that high contrast uh, creates. To me, there exist truths in astrophysical objects, and I enjoy communicating as many are as captured in the data. For example, here are three images of the famous um, galaxy NGC 7331. This galaxy features wonderful dust lanes in its disk that reach out all the way, or reach in all the way to the center. With particular processing choices, it's possible to display the dust lanes all the way to the core clearly and distinctly. But to me, the cost is high. Galaxies are truly brighter in their centers compared to their outer disks. Maintaining this truth and at the same time showing as many dust lanes as possible, that's my style. This means that although I show the dust lanes, they are more difficult to see in the center due to the lack of contrast. But to me, this is exactly what I expect to see when looking at something very bright, just like the centers of galaxies with you know, untold billions of stars. I process this galaxy with high contrast on the right, um, just to demonstrate again that it's possible to choose to do this, but I don't. The one on the left, the version on the left, I consider more natural and I think it communicates better these attributes of the galaxy that I want to really show off. So here's a picture of what appears to be a relatively nondescript you know, picture of space. But one of the very best astrophotographs ever taken was of an object hidden in the inky blackness of this field of view. In fact, to appreciate just how superlative this image is, we'll need to use some of the lessons that we've learned in this video, as well as find our place in the universe. To travel to the large distances that we need to, light speed is necessary. Light in a particular unit of time travels a particular distance. Take for example, sunlight. It takes light from the sun eight minutes once emitted from the sun to reach us here on the earth. So we say the sun is eight light minutes away. Now, if we use the all too terribly small earth units of say miles to measure this distance, we end up with 93 million miles. So light units are much more appropriate and convenient for measuring distances in space. Take the size of our solar system, and I'm gonna be very generous and include the interesting parts of our solar system. It might be around, let's say it's one light day across. It would take light then about 24 hours to go from one side of our solar system to the next, to the other side. What I'd like to do then is create a model that allows us to appreciate how far away the nearest stars are, how large our galaxy is, and where all of these other galaxies are. I'm going to use a penny to build this model. Say you could squish our entire solar system to the size of a penny. That means that the sun, the earth, comets, asteroids, everything you know and love, is now squished to within this penny area. A penny is a little more than a centimeter, but to make the numbers kind of nice, let's just say that one centimeter now is the size of our solar system, which is one light day. At this scale, then we can start to imagine how far away the very near nearest star is. Its name is Alpha Centauri, and it's located around four light years away. Let me see if I can get a picture of uh, Alpha Centauri here. Ah, oh, there it is. At this scale, at one light day, 
is one centimeter. So a light year is 365 centimeters or more than three meters away. Alpha Centauri then is four times that, it's four light years away. So four times further is 12 meters away. Now imagine you wanted to describe the size of our galaxy. You need only know two numbers. You just need to know how many stars are in our galaxy. That's how many pennies I'd need to build the galaxy at this scale. And I need to know how large the galaxy is so I can figure out how far to spread these pennies around. Well, our galaxy contains on the order of 200 billion stars. And it's certainly no less than 100,000 light years across. So to build our penny galaxy, I need to begin with 200 billion pennies. If I had 200 billion pennies, I'd be a pretty happy guy. Unfortunately, there aren't that many coins in circulation in the United States, but this is just all in our imagination. And I would need to spread these pennies out by some average distance from one another. Let's say in our galaxy that stars are on average separated by two light years from each other. Now our nearest neighbor is four light years away, but a good average, you know, just might be two. So at the scale we've been talking about, this is six meters in terms of uh, pennies from one to another. So now I know what's necessary to build the galaxy. If I actually did this, it would take a very long time, even with a thousand people setting down one penny every few seconds nonstop, it would still take a decade to complete this project. But again, just all in our imagination here, in this model, one light year is around three meters. So the galaxy would be 300,000 meters in diameter or 300 kilometers. And by the way, anyone that actually works through this math, again, I was underestimating everything. Everything is actually a little bit larger than this. So the numbers I've given so far for these estimates are actually larger. And uh, if this is our galaxy, as it appears like on the United States here in the Southwest, even at this scale, if you make our solar system just the size of a penny, to describe where other galaxies are, the Earth isn't even large enough at this scale. So you can begin to see what is required when you know trying to imagine these distances, these sizes, these scales, and so on. Our nearest neighbor is around 2.5 million light years away. And this, of course, is the Andromeda galaxy. The Andromeda galaxy spans this image nearly four degrees of the sky. If you were over there looking back at us, this might be how we appear, though I'd like to think that we have the better spiral arms. The stars you see in the picture are all in the foreground um, and they're part of our own galaxy. Zooming in to the center reveals dust lanes that swirl all the way into the nucleus. Note that I was not too aggressive with the contrast in order to communicate the brilliance of the downtown center. So we live on the outskirts of what is called the Virgo cluster of galaxies, the center of which is around 40 million light years away. And that, that is what this is a picture of. That's what is captured in this image. This is a wide field of view of that part of the sky, which contains thousands of galaxies, though they're pretty hard to see at this scale. You can see some of them though, as these fuzzy oval patches. Probably the most obvious ones are the ones kind of in the lower right here. Um, though you can see, if you look very closely at the screen, there's one here, there's a thing there, thing there. There are some others running around in this image. So let me turn on uh, labels for all of these galaxies. And when you look at this kind of annotated view, uh, with each annotation being a galaxy, now you can really see just how many galaxies there are. Uh, what I find interesting though, is that there is this wonderful gradient of galaxies that, you know, there are fewer galaxies in the upper left compared to those that are all down here in the lower right, uh, which is in the direction towards the center of the Virgo cluster. Um, so all of that is kind of making sense here. And what is interesting is that I have been fortunate to have been given the opportunity to take pictures 
of many of these galaxies in this part of the sky, lots of them. So each one of these things are interesting in their own right. So this thing right here is actually one of the largest and brightest of the spiral galaxies in the Virgo cluster. It's uh, M100, beautiful spiral galaxy. So if, instead of looking at the wide field image, if we zoom in and look at the image with uh, taken with the Schulman telescope, you can really see it's a, it's a wonderful galaxy. Uh, some other galaxies though that I think are interesting. There's a beautiful pair of galaxies in the lower left. Uh, one is an elliptical, one is a spiral here. So that's M60. And then uh, a galaxy that I think is overlooked all the time is M58 here. And I believe I have an image of M58. There it is. I just think that's an overlooked galaxy. It's a beautiful galaxy. And then we have here M91, more spiral galaxies, and uh, M88. So let's see those. Here's M91 and the beautiful spirals of M88. Now, what is interesting about what I just showed is that all of the spirals I just showed, none of them were in the lower right. They were all kind of at the peripheral, a periphery of the, the cluster as it is imaged or captured in this frame. And that makes sense because when galaxies orbit each other um, in a cluster, when they're very close to each other, they perturb each other gravitationally and delicate structure like spiral structure um, gets messed up. In fact, when galaxies truly collide, they morph into larger um, uh, amorphous blobs of you know, billions, if not trillions of stars, like these super elliptical galaxies in the center of the Virgo cluster. And in particular, the one that is of interest is this one right here. Now, it may not look all that exciting, but it really is a pretty interesting galaxy. This is M87, and that is where we want to journey to the heart of the Virgo cluster. So here we go. We journey to the heart of the Virgo cluster to M87. This galaxy is certainly the result of the collisions of many galaxies. M87 has the mass, if not billions, but trillions of stars. Magnifying the image more from the Pomenus astrograph to the Schulman telescope shows that there is something remarkable coming out of its core. It's unlike anything else observed in the local universe. This is a relativistic jet of gas and energy that stretches for tens of thousands of light years. Zooming in more with the HST picture shows the detail in the jet in hints at the fact that there's something monstrous, something very powerful in the core of M87 to create this outflow. The only thing known in the universe that can generate this much energy is a black hole. This is what has been assumed, but nary an example, single example ever directly seen for decades. If you recall, each pixel of HST sees a tiny 0.05 arc seconds of the sky. So if we were to zoom in to just a single pixel in this image and make it fill 1,000 pixels on the screen, then the center pixel is the size of the region captured by the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. This feat required combining the light simultaneously captured from a network of telescopes that spanned the globe. Nothing less than a telescope effectively the size of the Earth could have enough resolution to capture this region and directly observe the black hole at the heart of M87. This is a mapped, col uh, false color, I guess, image in the short radio wavelengths of light that were used to make the observations. Before the spring of 2017, pictures of black holes and magical unicorns were in the same category. We live in a time when a century old question, one for which much ink has been spilled, is answered. Yes, there are black holes in the universe. And yes, much of the physics looks about right. The region shown here is roughly a light day in extent. Recall the penny from our solar system earlier. And it has the mass of around 6 billion suns. This image is as fantastic as the object that it captures. And it's a first of its kind, a one of a kind, and really just an unbelievable astrophotograph to behold. 
And that was what I wanted to illustrate in order to show, this is my, my kind of uh, wrapping up of this presentation, in order to explain what this seemingly fuzzy donut image is, I'm gonna claim that you need to appreciate the interpretation of astronomical images based on field of view, resolution, color, all of that plays a role in interpreting this fuzzy donut. And so that's why I wanted to make this particular presentation in the more uh, general kind of publicly digestible sense. Uh, but I go a little deeper in terms of the ramifications of how to communicate with these ideas in mind um, in this upcoming article that I'll have in Sky and Telescope. So there we go. All right. I'll, I'll do this since you mentioned it earlier. So what do you think, Simon? I don't think anybody who was watching this was expecting that. Um, I partially did, uh, but the whole point is why I mentioned why I like seeing pictures um, showing in a certain way so you can see what's in front and what's behind. Yeah. Hopefully people understand based off of this, uh, what they just saw, it is what I'm really going with. Uh, let me just get this back into gallery view. There we go. So I'll tell you right now, there's a lot of people that have made some really nice comments uh, about this on the live chat. So I, I know this definitely, definitely went down an absolute storm. I got to admit, um, there are some times where I do go too crazy with the contrast in order to try and see something. But again, it's, it's my interpretation of what I'm trying to see because I'm trying to see the invisible or I'm making the invisible visible, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I get that. I get that. But that, the point, and I think you understand this, the point that I was trying to make is that there you can imagine that you can enumerate many attributes in terms of color and contrast and uh, features of an object mm -hmm. that... You, you ultimately have to choose is, is the really the important point here. And I want people who look at astronomical images to, to think about that, you know, to think about the fact that this processor, this image processor is communicating, you know, they really want me to, to, to see this thing and they didn't care so much about these other things. Whereas someone like myself, as I tried to explain, I obviously am doing something a little bit different in many ways in which I make some of those choices uh, compared to someone who wants to show off something else like what you just said. So in an image like this, you know, it was very important to me that not only are these dust lanes visible as part of the processing that required a choice that required the use of a high dynamic range application of uh, uh, to basically the whole image, but certainly with regards to this galaxy, because the galaxy itself is so bright that these features are not visible if you make the galaxy or you let the galaxy uh, kind of shine very brightly mm -hmm. in the terms of processing. And then there's something else though. Um, in order to do that, you have to choose how much of that high dynamic range processing you employ. You still wanna leave enough brightness that it looks like light is shining through here but if you um, flatten the image enough or you don't do it right, you, you're gonna end up with no color left over. And the, that's, that's another, these are competing attributes, if you will. There's also this fact that this arm of the galaxy here is redder than this arm on the left. And that's because there's dust in the foreground literally reddening the light of the galaxy that's behind us, which does communicate what you were talking about. This stuff really is in front and we can infer that from the color and that attribute would be lost if you didn't perhaps handle it thinking about that ahead of time. Now, that's that's what the is, point I wanted to make. Yes, what, what is the X feature on that galaxy? Because I've seen this picture before yeah, a lot of um, barred spirals. Mm -hmm. If you have a barred spiral, this is one of the theories anyway. Um, 
and you look at it edgewise, tend to look like peanut shaped galaxies. And this is a really good example of that. There are a number of others. So there's one that's a 5,000, I can't remember its name now. Uh, another really good example um, of these kinds of edge on views of what are probably barred spirals. Uh, one quick question. Uh, when will the article appear in what issue? Uh, January. It'll appear in the January issue. Of Sky and Telescope. Sky and Telescope, yeah. Okay. So uh, hopefully that answers that question there if you, yeah, yeah, if, you if they missed that. Um, I'm just going to scan through to see because most of them are comments. Uh, I will admit, like I said, um, I, th I think people weren't ready for something like this. Well, I, you know, yeah, I, I wanted to do something obviously that people have not seen before. Why not? Exactly. I, I, you know what? I hate to say this. When I'm listening, I, I, for some weird reason, all I heard is Morgan Friedman voice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here, so, me, uh, I can come back. I can come back here on my uh, video. Maybe I don't know how to do that. I like the Southwest view, right? Yeah. So, are there are there any other questions? I don't want to keep your. Oh no, that's all. That's all good. Um, yeah. So, if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to put them through right now. Um, I do have Adam held down for another 10, 15 minutes, so he can't escape from us just yet. Um, I do have a question for you. This I, I, I get asked this as well sometimes. Um, how do you interpret what is actually correct and what is not correct? Because obviously when I look at a, a Hubble Space Telescope image, um, right. it's a narrow band image right. and it's obviously false color. But right. in reality, none of us have really seen what any of this looks like. Let's do the Helix Nebula since you've got it right there. That's a prime example. Sure. How do we know that that is the correct representation, even though we physically have never seen it? Well, let me let me say it this way. Um, these wavelengths of light are wavelengths that we can directly see with our eyes. So you'll give me that, right? Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, there's not enough of them so we can just stare at the sky and see this pink thing. That we, if we, if we could you know, if we could somehow enhance our vision, which is what we do with these uh, Let's go sensors, see the cameras, yep. Yeah, the camera, if you put your, I mean, you know, if you put your regular digital DSLR camera at the back of the telescope and you just expose for 30 seconds, you will get a pink thing and a bluish green thing in the middle. It will look like this. And the only reason, of course, we just can't do with our eyes, an eyeball problem. So, uh, if you have faith that when you go outside and you take a picture of the trees and the birds and your friends with your digital camera, that that doesn't change when you hook it up to the back of the telescope, then I think we can agree that these wavelengths of light are visible wavelengths of light. And furthermore, you know, the way in which we would see it if our eyes were as sensitive is close to this. Now, there are the vagaries of the fact that the sensor itself and the filters uh, you know, there is a somewhat of a mismatch between how they respond to light and how our eyes respond to light, but it is more similar than it is different. We would agree with the sensor. The sensor would say it's this wavelength of light, which is red. Our eyes would agree, hey, that looks red. So we are in more agreement than we would be not. In terms of the mapped color, though, that's, you know, that's different. The narrow band stuff, rather. Uh, that's different in the sense that we're just not using all the wavelengths of light. Now, we are used to, with our eyes, blending, actually comparing, if you will, degrees of the amount of one color of light to another. So when you subtract colors of light, it adds up with a wonderful contrast image, but this is just not, this is foreign to the way that we process information with our, with our eyes when we have many different colors of light. We just blend it all together. So na narrow band imagery is a little different. Um, but broadband images, I mean, it's more similar than it is different, I, I would argue. What do you think? Right. No, I, I agree because um, I, I like to use the ring nebula as the prime example. When you look at it through the telescope and, and let's just say you've got an exceptionally dark sky, good clear night and a relatively large scope of some description, you can pick out some of the colors. Uh, some people say you kind of have to use averted vision, but I do see that green and that yellow uh, occasionally, depending now on where I, I am. So I'm gonna tell you um, 
I am very fortunate. I will tell you just how fortunate I am. I am fortunate enough to have looked through the four meter uh, Mayall telescope at Kitt Peak, as well as what is even better, the uh, wind telescope, which is a 3.5 meter telescope many times. Um, to give you a sense, I can directly, you can directly see the jet in M87 with your eye through the, through the wind telescope, the 3.5 meter telescope. It's very cool. You what, can, really? Oh yeah, easy. You can see the, um, the markings the, of uh, Regio, whatever it is on Ganymede and the other moons um, through the, the 3.5 meter, because the, it's not just the light gathering of a three and a half meter telescope, it's also the seeing. So the combination of those two on top of Kitt Peak is remarkable. Um, and then to get to planetary nebula, because they are so bright, they are just insane through a three and a half meter telescope with good seeing. Now, I will tell you, even through, I've got reason, very pretty good eyes, I would say, even through those telescopes, um, looking at planetary nebula, you, you just can't see red. There's just no red. You can see variations of green, blue, uh, but there is just no red. Now, I, I might be, I don't know, making upset some visual observers who believe that they can see red. Um, no, I, I'm going to tell you, no, I can't see red. What I think or I know is supposed to be red, I usually see it as just gray fuzz. Yeah, yeah. So uh, no reds out there, unfortunately. It's just, and, and, and I want to speak from, I want to say I'm an authority in another way, which is that, you know, I, for, for 20 years, basically, I looked <laughs> through telescopes for my job every single night. Yep. So the public, these things in the telescope. And, and so what I get to do is I get to sample tens of thousands of people whose eyeballs look through, you know, the telescope. It's not just my perception of the way the world is, uh, but I can also literally survey thousands of other people. Um, and no one sees red. Nobody. Yeah, no, I agree with you there wholeheartedly. Oh, yeah. I, so, but there are some red. Pe there are people out there that claim they see red. I'm telling you that. And I don't know. Oh, well, that's down to them. Yep. There you go. <laughs> Maybe I'll get hate mail now. I haven't really gotten any hate mail before. <laughs> I'm sure Don Penzak will be emailing you right now. <laughs> All right, there we go. <laughs> they'll be. They'll literally be seeing red when they hear me. So. <laughs> Um, real, uh, one question from somebody, um, which NGC number is that X galaxy? Oh, 157. That, uh, yeah, which one in particular? There, there are like three of them there, right? Um, uh, the one that we you were showing. Uh, I know, the... but, are, but it's a cluster of them. Oh, it's a cluster, okay. Yeah, or a gr uh, yeah a cluster, a group. Uh, let me go back in time here. Was it? Oh, I'll just go there, sorry. It was um, these guys. So yes. NGC 125 and 127 are the two main two main ones. So there are lots of galaxies in here, right? Right, right. Yeah, there you go. OK, so another question. Um, how would you start to explain a nebula to a non-astronomer looking at one of your pictures? I often have this problem just explaining the vastness and the distance. Hmm. Well, I guess what I would say is that there are two, there are different reasons that things can be fuzzy in an image. Things can be fuzzy because they literally are clouds, just like clouds in the sky. And we see them as fuzzy in a picture as in a nebula, which of course literally comes from the Latin for the word cloud. All, however, you can also see things which appear fuzzy like galaxies like this, and they aren't nebula in the sense that we're looking at unresolved things, which of course, unfortunately requires the, uh, you know, an understanding or the explanation that when you have things very far away, many things very far away, you just see the combined glow of light and not any individual constituent part of that feature. So if you can explain that, then I think you'll be able to explain most things that we see in uh, astronomical images. So for example, if we look at a, you know, a nebula that looks something like, um, I'm going to go with, I don't know, the bubble nebula. Why not? It's a nice thing. 
So in an image like this, it's easy to say that all of the dots are individual stars and everything that looks fuzzy, it's fuzzy because it, even if we were there, it's gonna be fuzzy. They are literally clouds. So some of the clouds have these wonderful features to them, uh, but they are clouds of gas nonetheless that are being made to glow due to stars that are near them. In this case, this particular star is mostly responsible for making the surrounding cloud or clouds of gas glow this particular reddish bit of light. I don't know. I think that's, that's the way that I would approach it anyway. You, you just need to spell out the fact that there are clouds, but there are also things that are so far away that um, you can't see it. Uh, and so it looks fuzzy as well. And I think um, a lot of the times where people um, have a trouble understanding of why you can see the nebula is the difference between the emission and the reflection nebula. I'm not going to go huh. into dark nebula too much because that's a different story. But, I actually think dark nebula are pretty obvious though, right? I mean, they literally, that's, they look yeah, that's, like blocking the view, right? Right. That's, that's usually why I kind of explain it in a certain way because certain things or certain objects um, cannot be seen through narrow band. They have to be seen through broad, broadband. And it, it's always been, um, it's always a tough time for me to explain it to people when they're, when they're starting off imaging is they, they just simply don't know what they're going to be looking for. Mm -hmm. Take a picture of something and go, well, I didn't see it. And I said, well, what was the object? And then um, they'll, they'll say the object. I said, well, hold on a minute. That's a reflection nebula. That's different. Oh, I see. So you mean in terms of an imager mm -hmm. where they might take a picture of a field that looks like this and they yes. wonder why they don't see an awful lot. Well, we have clouds of dust that block the view. And then we also have bluish light that is scattered, basically, you know, Raleigh scattering um, where we have uh, preferentially this particular color of light scattered in our direction. So it looks bluish, but sure enough, if you put a filter in front that, you know, it blocks blue light, you're not gonna see anything. And there's nothing emitting any other color in this picture. So sure enough, if you did this in hydrogen alpha, you know, HO, um, oxygen and everything else, nothing's gonna show up in this field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. indeed. Although what is kind of interesting is that sometimes if you do take a picture of a field like this in say hydrogen alpha, you might be surprised to find things that are not obvious. Um, you might find little red things that show up with more contrast that may actually be Harrow, you know, Herberg, Harrow, Harrow, Herberg, Herberg, Harrow objects. So for example, let me just show an example here because it's kind of cool, this one. This is a, probably a, uh, a field that very few people are familiar with. It's part of the uh, Taurus molecular cloud. And I don't know of any deep images of this particular object, but if you took a picture of this field, you would see with much more ease this jet coming out here. It does show up even in broadband, which is cool. Uh, but it would be interesting to take a long uh, H-alpha picture and perhaps see it. And there may even be something right around uh, C.W. Torrey here, because I believe it has the genesis of the jet that comes out of it just a few arc seconds from the star itself. Uh, so sometimes you can find some hidden gems uh, mm. that reveal themselves with more contrast by looking at things that you might not have otherwise thought to do. Otherwise, I mean, you know, there's nothing in here that would scream, oh, there must be hydrogen alpha emission, but... No, know, that's right. I mean, this, this is why I like these types of images is I'm, I'm able to see um, not, not necessarily a structure, but I can almost see a three-dimensional aspect of the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, definitely. Yep, yeah. When you have the dark things in the front and the, the sky is actually brighter than, I mean, that's what, that's what makes the key, the key thing here is that the sky is brighter than the dark nebula, which by the way, is a processing choice, Yes. Right? I mean, yes. it, it's a it's a seemingly obvious thing to do, but if you have a field that has dark nebula, you don't want to make the sky black, or else you know it'd be what? hard to see the dark nebula, right? Um, I saw you had a picture of the North American Pelican Nebula. This is a classic example of what we're oh, talking well that, about. Oh, that was another choice. Yeah, so yeah, this is a classic good. example. Um, there it is. In fact, most people do not choose the way that I do it here. 
I chose to display this image to really highlight the fact that there are, you know, there, this is part of our Milky Way, right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people display this image trying to minimize in some sense the amount of stars that you see so the nebula stands out. But for me, I wanted the nebula to kind of live in this area amongst the stars, if you will, because um, I, I just thought it better represents this piece of sky um, as, as you know, a part of our galaxy that just has so many stars. Uh, but certainly, you know, this part of the sky in this very dark area, that must be in the foreground. And we just don't see some of the things that are behind it. Um, and some of those things are actually important. Some of the stars that are behind this are very likely the, the, uh, the sources of illumination here of this region of sky, because there's nothing very obvious in the sky that's doing it. And a bright star like this, um, there are only very few very bright stars here. They are very likely, again, in the foreground, and that's only because we can infer with all of these clouds of dust that are pervading the field uh, that they would have otherwise been tampered down, you know, um, less obvious. That's the way you can kind of interpret maybe this field. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I like using the North American nebula, the Wall of Cygnus area specifically, um, all the time to show what is in front and what is behind, because you can almost, when you get a, like a, a really narrow field of view of just the Wall of Cygnus, you see that the dark nebula that's in front rains down almost. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, I know I can't really say it rained down because there's no up or down or left in I, space, I, so to speak. But you, you see the structure behind it. But again, we can't really detect the shape of that dark nebula. We just know it's in front. Right. Yeah. Excellent. All right. So um, we're going to pretty much call an end to this one um, because we probably can go on forever and ever and ever. Uh, for those guys at home, uh, we will be back in about two weeks time. Um, what we're going to probably be doing for the next one is this is going to be all girls astronomy. Um, I know some of you uh, people who are watching at home will probably end up being a part of this, but we're going to try something a little different that I did with Scott Roberts, where we have like a roundtable discussions type scenario. Uh, so I'm actually looking forward to doing that. And it's going to be all girls. So this is going to be a fun one, hopefully. Um, Simon, before I... Yes. Uh... Before I leave, I just want to mention that this particular, oh goodness, I don't know what this is. Sorry, this is YouTube. I'm trying to get to my channel, which I don't know how to do. Uh, here, let's just do this. I have a YouTube channel. So the presentation that I just gave is in a video form. So it might be useful to people who um, are interested in, uh, you know, if they want to take advantage or use it in some way, you'll find it here on the on the channel. And of course, it would be great if people did use it if they subscribe, you know, to my YouTube channel, because then uh, you would be made well aware of other similar kinds of videos that might also be useful for public outreach or processing or anything like that. So I just want to mention there's a YouTube channel, the video is there, please use it. Um, if you thought that it was informative. So yeah, for those guys that are watching at home, um... We will be replaying this. Obviously, you can watch it anytime you want, or you can watch uh, Adam's original version of it up on YouTube. I do su suggest that you watch it again. It is absolutely fascinating. Uh, try not to hear Morgan Freeman's voice, because I still do. <laughs> not Morgan Freeman. Okay. <laughs> we'll work on that one. Okay. All right. So until the next one, I will see you uh, in about two weeks' time. Okay. And we'll go from there.